High performance habits, becoming an extraordinary person and achieve extraordinary results, including Miracle Morning and NLP, by Mike Deans, and read by Jordan Reader. The power of habits. I'm going to start off with a really powerful quote by Mike Murdoch, which goes, "The secret of your success is hidden in your daily routine." I saw another good one too the other day that said, "Successful people do what unsuccessful people are not prepared to do," and that's exactly my point. There are hundreds of little things we either are doing or not doing that affect the degree of success that we've achieved. A habit is an action done so many times that we don't even have to think consciously about doing it anymore. Most people agree that it takes 21 days to form a habit and only three days to break it. For example, when we were very small, we were all trained to brush our teeth every morning. The toothbrush with toothpaste was given to us, and we dutifully brushed our teeth every day. Now. I don't know anyone at my age that has to really think about brushing his or her teeth. I know that I stumble to the bathroom half asleep and brush my teeth automatically. Why? It's a habit. Aristotle once said, "We are what we repeatedly do," and this shows the power of habit. If we're repeatedly doing things that lead to greater success, then we will be successful. But if we're repeatedly doing things that hinder our success, We will not get what we want in life. I just had a friend come over from the Netherlands, and she rented a car. Now, most of you know that in Australia we drive on the left side, so a couple of things are reversed, and some are the same. It was amazing to see how she initially was actually thrown off her feet and felt quite anxious in the beginning. And it was great to hear that after a while she got used to driving on the left side. The human brain is an amazing tool, capable of running multiple simultaneous processes. Even a skill like driving a car or riding a bike, which many people take for granted, involves massive amounts of parallel processing. For instance, keep heart beating, monitor other vehicles, set and correct steering. Move limbs independently, adjust focal range, keep a goal in mind, breathe, adjust blood pH levels, predict behavior of others, predict stopping distances, etc. I often tell my clients and students that your unconscious is running the show. That's most of what we do each day. Over ninety percent of our behaviors is done automatically by the unconscious mind. The benefit of this is that it means that most of what we can do can be delegated to the unconscious mind, leaving our conscious mind free to focus on what's really important. Your conscious minds are for focusing, and the ability to focus your conscious mind is one of the most powerful abilities a person can develop, because that's how you build new habits. You can use your conscious to build new habits. As you're probably already aware, habits are powerful. Once something is habitual, your unconscious does it for you. It's virtually effortless. This goes for nice habits: brushing your teeth, working out, meditating, preparing healthy food, as well as nasty ones: smoking, watching TV, eating takeaway food. It takes about a month to create a new habit, but once you've created it, you can let it run. Of course, as everyone who's ever tried to change everything at once knows, there are a limited number of new habits you can create at any one time. If you take time to think about your daily routine, you'll notice lots of good habits like driving within the speed limit, drinking two liters of water daily, etc. A few years ago, I decided that I needed to start drinking more water. So. On the first of January, nineteen ninety-eight, I started forcing myself to drink two liters of water every day. This habit took hold in only fourteen days, because after the first two weeks, it was easy, and it's been that way ever since. Now, in the same way that good habits are formed, bad habits are also created just as easily. 
I know of people who start saving, say, $100 every month, and everything goes well for three or four months. Then they decide to go on holiday and stop saving for one month. The snag is that it doesn't end up being just one month, because the habit they were creating has been broken. The next month, it's easier to spend that $100 on clothes, and after the third month, they're back to square one. So, this month, I want to encourage you to think about some good habits you want to start implementing, and some bad habits that you need to replace with good ones. If you currently have a bad habit at work of shuffling paper around and not dealing with it, start this month by being disciplined and either filing it, working on it, or throwing it away. When you're tempted to just throw it back into your in-tray or start making a pile on your desk, stop. Remember that you have the power to break that bad habit and start creating some good ones. And the same goes for driving. If you're like me and let others on the road irritate you, stop and tell yourself that you're going to replace all that negative behavior with something positive. Maybe you need to start saying things like, I'm perfectly calm and stress-free in traffic. In the subsequent chapters, I will show you proven and practical high-performance habits you can start implementing to live a better life. However, I need to talk about something and that's being extraordinary. Are you ordinary or extraordinary? Most of us want to believe and feel that we're extraordinary, but if we're honest, we feel pretty ordinary. We go about our lives acting ordinarily. To be extraordinary, you'd have to do things in an extraordinary way. That requires that you leave your comfort zone. As long as you remain in it, You remain ordinary. What is ordinary? What do I mean by being ordinary? Here are some examples. Ordinary is not doing your best at work or giving 100% in all your endeavors. It's yelling at your kids, even though you know that's not being the type of parent you want and could be. But yelling is a habit you haven't been willing to break. Being ordinary could be fighting with your sister, walking away angry, and then not repairing the relationship. As a result, you go through life with a constrained sibling relationship. Ordinary could not be telling your husband that you're angry at him all the time because you've fallen out of love and feel guilty that you want a divorce, but don't dare to say so. And ordinary can be sitting on the couch for two hours every night watching television but claiming you have no time to write that book you've been talking about for years. What is extraordinary? Transforming yourself from ordinary into extraordinary involves doing the hard stuff, the stuff many of us avoid. We avoid it because it's scary and uncomfortable, and it requires that we exert effort, extra effort. Being extraordinary could mean going above and beyond at work, turning in a project early and with more elements than your boss expected. It could mean apologizing to your children for yelling and explaining why you do so, and committing to speaking to them without anger going forward and following through on that commitment. Extraordinary would be telling your sister you're sorry for harboring anger and taking responsibility for your part in the estranged relationship. And extraordinary could be you telling your husband the truth and apologizing for making him the brunt of your guilt. Additionally, it could be coming from home four nights per week and writing for an hour before you reward yourself with an hour of relaxing television watching. Remember, it's normal to be ordinary. So don't beat yourself up for your ordinary thoughts words, actions, or reactions. You are a human being. We humans tend to be pretty ordinary, unless we decide to become extraordinary and consciously work toward that end. So, forgive yourself for the times you are ordinary. But if you want to be extraordinary, exert the extra effort necessary. It's really not that difficult to live an extraordinary life. 
Most people look at those who are having success around them and desire the same thing, but end up tossing their dreams into the too hard basket. They don't understand that going from ordinary to extraordinary involves doing just that little bit extra. Is how I managed to live and travel the world for fourteen years, grow one of the most popular travel blogs online in just a year, and land a partnership project with Cantas, and have very quick success with my mummy blog. All you need to concentrate on is doing ten percent more than those around you, that little bit extra in the following areas in subsequent chapters. Start dreaming. High performance habits, becoming an extraordinary person, and achieve extraordinary results, including Miracle Morning and NLP, by Mike Deans, and read by Jordan Reader. The power of habits. I'm going to start off with a really powerful quote by Mike Murdoch, which goes: "The secret of your success is hidden in your daily routine." I saw another good one too the other day that said, "Successful people do what unsuccessful people are not prepared to do," and that's exactly my point. There are hundreds of little things we either are doing or not doing that affect the degree of success that we've achieved. A habit is an action done so many times that we don't even have to think consciously about doing it anymore. Most people agree that it takes 21 days to form a habit and only three days to break it. For example, when we were very small, we were all trained to brush our teeth every morning. The toothbrush with toothpaste was given to us, and we dutifully brushed our teeth every day. Now, I don't know anyone at my age that has to really think about brushing his or her teeth. I know that I stumble to the bathroom. Half asleep and brush my teeth automatically. Why? It's a habit. Aristotle once said, "We are what we repeatedly do," and this shows the power of habit. If we're repeatedly doing things that lead to greater success, then we will be successful. But if we're repeatedly doing things that hinder our success, then we'll not get what we want in life. I just had a friend come over from the Netherlands, and she rented a car. Now, most of you know that in Australia we drive on the left side, so a couple of things are reversed, and some are the same. It was amazing to see how she initially was actually thrown off her feet and felt quite anxious in the beginning, and it was great to hear that after a while she got used to driving on the left side. The human brain is an amazing tool. Capable of running multiple simultaneous processes, even a skill like driving a car or riding a bike, which many people take for granted, involves massive amounts of parallel processing. For instance, keep heart beating, monitor other vehicles, set and correct steering, move limbs independently, adjust focal range, keep a goal in mind, breathe, adjust blood pH levels. Predict behavior of others, predict stopping distances, etc. I often tell my clients and students that your unconscious is running the show. That's most of what we do each day. Over ninety percent of our behaviors is done automatically by the unconscious mind. The benefit of this is that it means that most of what we can do can be delegated to the unconscious mind. Leaving our conscious mind free to focus on what's really important. Your conscious minds are for focusing, and the ability to focus your conscious mind is one of the most powerful abilities a person can develop, because that's how you build new habits. You can use your conscious to build new habits, as you're probably already aware. Habits are powerful. Once something is habitual. Your unconscious does it for you. It's virtually effortless. This goes for nice habits: brushing your teeth, working out, meditating, preparing healthy food, as well as nasty ones: smoking, watching TV, eating takeaway food. It takes about a month to create a new habit, but once you've created it, you can let it run. 
Of course, as everyone who's ever tried to change everything at once knows, there are a limited number of new habits you can create at any one time. If you take time to think about your daily routine, you'll notice lots of good habits like driving within the speed limit, drinking two liters of water daily, etc. A few years ago, I decided that I needed to start drinking more water. So, on the first of January, nineteen ninety-eight, I started forcing myself to drink two liters of water every day. This habit took hold in only fourteen days, because after the first two weeks, it was easy, and it's been that way ever since. Now, in the same way that good habits are formed, bad habits are also created just as easily. I know of people who start saving, say, a hundred dollars every month, and everything goes well for three or four months. Then they decide to go on holiday and stop saving for one month. The snag is that it doesn't end up being just one month because the habit they were creating has been broken. The next month, it's easier to spend that one hundred dollars on clothes, and after the third month, they're back to square one. So this month, I want to encourage you to think about some good habits you want to start implementing, and some bad habits that you need to replace with good ones. If you currently have a bad habit at work of shuffling paper around and not dealing with it, start this month by being disciplined and either filing it, working on it, or throwing it away. When you're tempted to just throw it back into your in tray or start making a pile on your desk, stop. Remember that you have the power to break that bad habit and start creating some good ones. And the same goes for driving. If you're like me and let others on the road irritate you, stop and tell yourself that you're going to replace all that negative behavior with something positive. Maybe you need to start saying things like, "I'm perfectly calm and stress-free in traffic." In the subsequent chapters, I will show you proven and practical high-performance habits you can start implementing to live a better life. However, I need to talk about something. And that's being extraordinary. Are you ordinary or extraordinary? Most of us want to believe and feel that we are extraordinary, but if we're honest, we feel pretty ordinary, and we go about our lives acting ordinarily. To be extraordinary, you'd have to do things in an extraordinary way. That requires that you leave your comfort zone. As long as you remain in it. You remain ordinary. What is ordinary? What do I mean by being ordinary? Here are some examples. Ordinary is not doing your best at work or giving a hundred percent in all your endeavors. It's yelling at your kids, even though you know that's not being the type of parent you want and could be. But yelling is a habit you haven't been willing to break. Being ordinary could be fighting with your sister, walking away angry, and then not repairing the relationship. As a result, you go through life with a constrained sibling relationship. Ordinary could not be telling your husband that you're angry at him all the time because you've fallen out of love and feel guilty that you want a divorce, but don't dare to say so. And ordinary can be sitting on the couch for two hours every night watching television. But claiming you have no time to write that book you've been talking about for years. What is extraordinary? Transforming yourself from ordinary into extraordinary involves doing the hard stuff, the stuff many of us avoid. We avoid it because it's scary and uncomfortable, and it requires that we exert effort, extra effort. Being extraordinary could mean going above and beyond at work, turning in a project early and with more elements than your boss expected. It could mean apologizing to your children for yelling and explaining why you do so, and committing to speaking to them without anger going forward, and following through on that commitment. Extraordinary would be telling your sister you're sorry for harboring anger and taking responsibility. For your part in the estranged relationship, and extraordinary could be you 
telling your husband the truth and apologizing for making him the brunt of your guilt. Additionally, it could be coming from home four nights per week and writing for an hour before you reward yourself with an hour of relaxing television watching. Remember, it's normal to be ordinary. So, don't beat yourself up for your ordinary thoughts, words, actions, or reactions. You are a human being. We humans tend to be pretty ordinary, unless we decide to become extraordinary and consciously work toward that end. So, forgive yourself for the times you are ordinary. But if you want to be extraordinary, exert the extra effort necessary. It's really not that difficult to live an extraordinary life. Most people look at those who are having success around them and desire the same thing, but end up tossing their dreams into the too hard basket. They don't understand that going from ordinary to extraordinary involves doing just that little bit extra. It's how I managed to live and travel the world for 14 years, grow one of the most popular travel blogs online in just a year, and land a partnership project with Cantas, and have very quick success with my mummy blog. All you need to concentrate on is doing 10% more than those around you, that little bit extra in the following areas in subsequent chapters. Start dreaming. Everything in life starts with a dream. Those who move on to the attainment of their goals understand how important doing that little bit extra is with dreaming. When we were a child and someone asks us a question of what we want when we grow up, we can easily answer and say like, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a lawyer. But now, ask someone in your office what they want in life. Maybe they'll just say they want a phone, they want a car, a new dress, or house, perhaps. Dreaming is free, but a kid and a grown-up like me have different point of view regarding it. When kids answer to this question, they won't hesitate to answer, no matter how big their dreams are. They didn't mean to worry if it's achievable or not. What they do know is that they want it, and it can be achieved is something that, for them, nothing can hinder towards realising it. But as we grow up, we tend to realise that the world is harsh. Given the opportunity to answer the same question, we may pause for a while and think of something that can be realistic and more achievable. In short, we might dream something smaller. This is mainly because our mindset is affected by lots of facts that give us fear of dreaming big. We tend to analyse a lot, thus limiting our ability to think big. As a result, this fear becomes a hindrance to achieve greater things in life. Back in the good old days of school, the teachers would often catch us for daydreaming in class and not paying attention. Stop dreaming. Dreaming will get you nowhere, yelled the teacher. Is it really so? Does dreaming really get you nowhere in life? The answer is yes and no. If you dream and you took massive action to achieve your dream, your dream could very well come true for you. However, if you dream and take no action, it remains just a powerless dream. Every success in this world always starts off with a dream. A dream to earning passive income from internet marketing, a dream to join venture with well-known gurus, and a dream to earn $10,000 a day from a web business. In short, in order to accomplish great things, you need to have a dream. A dream will give you the vision, the drive, the energy to channel all your available resources into it, propelling you to greater heights towards the fulfilment of your goals. As the saying goes, if you can see it, you can have it. If you are able to see your dream in your mind, you would be able to work towards it. However, if you're not able to see the dream at all, there is absolutely no dream for you to reach out to. 
When that happens, you will always remain at where you are, and there will not be any significant breakthrough in your life. Not only must you be able to see your dream, you must also see it with clarity. The image that you see in your dream cannot be vague; it must be as clear as crystal, so that you know exactly what you want and where you're heading to. Plus, you must be able to see yourself in that place in that time. My personal sharing and interpretations. I dream. Do you? I think that most people dream, but most people do not remember their dreams when they wake up in the next morning. Sometimes I only remember my dreams at a later time in the day. How interesting! Most people don't bother about their dreams because they do not regard them as significant or scientifically proven to be of truth related to their lives. Another reason why most people do not bother about their dreams is because they think that dream interpretations are being superstitious. Well, for myself, I hardly dreamt in the early part of my life, during childhood to teenage years, and therefore was not aware that there are many people who dreamed a lot out there. When my friends asked me if I dream, I boasted that I don't dream. And felt sorry for those who often dream. It was a funny rationale I had at that time, but I started dreaming more often when I was in my twenties. And amazingly, I could remember some, not all, of the dreams I had. I also started to journal them as soon as I waked up in the morning, because they often slipped off my mind if I do not record them. This is my personal experience, as I often regret for being lazy when I forgot those precious dreams. As I often regret being lazy when I forgot those precious dreams. Just to share, have a notepad beside your bed so that you can jot down your dreams even when you wake up in the middle of the night. I had different types of dreams. Some are clear, some are not. Some are in color, some are in black and white. Some are mute. Some are audible. Some are in series, while others are isolated. But most of the time, I could remember only in part, unless the dream is short. It's also difficult to remember every detail, and they often get blurry. I believe that dreams are given for a purpose, nothing coincidental or accidental. Dreams can be supernatural, i.e., divine. Or revelation of our inner true state of mind. To me, dreams could serve as a way of communication, warning, foresight, or a way to understand the inner depth of ourselves, the real me inside. We need wisdom or discernment to differentiate meaningful dreams and those that came as a result of too much television or dramatic experience before sleep. Objects, people, animals, colors, numbers, etc., have symbolism, and each of us would have to build up our own vocabulary and interpretation library because each of us had different emotions attached to various objects or people. For example, a cat may be cute to one but arrogant to another. In order to bring success into your life that you've always dreamed about and that you truly feel you deserve, you must dream big. One of my most favorite quotes about dreaming big goes like this: "You will never live a life beyond your wildest expectations until you first have some wild expectations." I want you to think back to when you were a kid. And I bet you can remember some wild dreams you had. I know I did, and I bet you did too. Even if you say you cannot remember them, unfortunately, as you're growing up, those dreams are killed by adults, teachers, and other adults of influence repeatedly, repeatedly telling you that you must be realistic and find jobs that will pay your bills and give you a good retirement. In other words, they were stealing your dreams from you and lower your expectations, and not to mention your self-esteem and confidence levels as well. In order to achieve any levels of true success that you desire, 
It's going to be your ability and determination to break free from this destructible line of thinking that has brainwashed you all these years, that has gotten you stuck in the life you're now leading, and that is leaving you unfulfilled and unhappy and buried your dreams far back into your memory. Big success is created from having a burning desire to succeed, and that burning desire to succeed must be harnessed to bring your passion, drive, discipline, and your determination to capture your dreams and make your dreams come true. It's your dreams that are the fuel that you will need to motivate you to push forward when things are not going your way and obstacles seem too tough to overcome, and this will happen from time to time. It's your dreams that allow you to break from the pack and stand on your own from the crowd. However, if you do not follow your dreams, you're just part of the crowd, and there will be a small part of you that dies from the lack of fulfillment you have in your life, from your non-pursuit of your dreams. It's your dreams that give you the fulfillment and accomplishment that you desire and the life that you want to live. If you've not already, you need to start dreaming again. And when you do, dream big. You need to start imagining the biggest dreams you can that you wish to have fulfilled in your life and not to worry about the size of the dream. Just imagine it. It's your dreams that will inspire you, that will motivate you, and most of all, should scare you. Your dreams should make your heart pound fast, sweat break out on your forehead from nervousness, and a smile across your face as your breath is being taken away. If these things are not happening, your dream is not big enough. Daydreaming can have a bad reputation as a wasteful, idle, pie-in-the-sky activity, and an optional one. Here's the truth. The ability to dream is a life skill, and especially a critical business one. Our dreams carry us to the vision of what we want. They help us identify core truths, and they help us to relate ourselves and other people, and help us relate to ourselves and other people. These are common objections, obstacles, and oppositions to dreaming. Which ones can you relate to? Dreaming isn't realistic. If I dream about something, I need to make a lifetime commitment to it. I don't remember how to dream. Dreaming is for kids, not adults with responsibilities. What's the value in a dream? I'll only think about something that I can have. I have no idea how to dream. The thought of it makes me tense and stressed. I'm trying to dream, and it's not working. Dreamers are people who don't get anything done. Dreams assist us to form our identities. When we don't dream, we cut off from an important part of ourselves, the unconscious mind that drives much of decision-making and action-taking. And the universe does want to help us bring our dreams to fruition. It's truly enough to say, this is my dream. What's the next best step? This request scares some of us. It can dredge up notions such as, what am I worth? Do I deserve to have my dreams come true? If my dreams come true, do I have to pay in some other area of life? Today's accomplishments are yesterday's dreams and imaginations. If you look around you at the tall buildings, yachts, aeroplanes, cell phones, television radio, these were all people's dreams at one time. Our dreams are the starting point for any kind of success. As Albert Einstein says, imagination is the preview of life's coming attractions. Everyone talks about the importance of dreams and imagination. Dreaming. Everything in life starts with a dream. Those who move on to the attainment of their goals understand how important doing that little bit extra is with dreaming. When we were a child and someone asks us a question of what we want when we grow up, we can easily answer and say like, I want to be a doctor or I want to be a lawyer. 
But now, ask someone in your office what they want in life. Maybe they'll just say they want a phone, they want a car, a new dress, or house, perhaps. Dreaming is free, but a kid and a grown-up like me have different point of view regarding it. When kids answer to this question, they won't hesitate to answer, no matter how big their dreams are. They didn't mean to worry if it's achievable or not. What they do know is that they want it, and it can be achieved. Is something that, for them, nothing can hinder towards realizing it. But as we grow up, we tend to realize that the world is harsh. Given the opportunity to answer the same question, we may pause for a while and think of something that can be realistic and more achievable. In short, we might dream something smaller. This is mainly because our mindset is affected by lots of facts that give us fear of dreaming big. We tend to analyze a lot, thus limiting our ability to think big. As a result, this fear becomes a hindrance to achieve greater things in life. Back in the good old days of school, the teachers would often catch us for daydreaming in class and not paying attention. Stop dreaming. Dreaming will get you nowhere," yelled the teacher. "Is it really so? Does dreaming really get you nowhere in life? The answer is yes and no. If you dream and you took massive action to achieve your dream, your dream could very well come true for you. However, if you dream and take no action, it remains just a powerless dream. Every success in this world always starts off with a dream, a dream to earning passive income from internet marketing, a dream to join venture with well-known gurus, and a dream to earn ten thousand dollars a day from a web business. In short, in order to accomplish great things, you need to have a dream. A dream will give you the vision, the drive. The energy to channel all your available resources into it, propelling you to greater heights towards the fulfillment of your goals. As the saying goes, "If you can see it, you can have it." If you are able to see your dream in your mind, you would be able to work towards it. However, if you're not able to see the dream at all, there is absolutely no dream for you to reach out to. When that happens, you will always remain at where you are, and there will not be any significant breakthrough in your life. Not only must you be able to see your dream, you must also see it with clarity. The image that you see in your dream cannot be vague; it must be as clear as crystal, so that you know exactly what you want and where you're heading to. Plus, you must be able to see yourself in that place in that time. My personal sharing and interpretations. I dream. Do you? I think that most people dream, but most people do not remember their dreams when they wake up in the next morning. Sometimes I only remember my dreams at a later time in the day. How interesting. Most people don't bother about their dreams because they do not regard them as significant or scientifically proven to be of truth related to their lives. Another reason why most people do not bother about their dreams is because they think that dream interpretations are being superstitious. Well, for myself, I hardly dreamt in the early part of my life, during childhood to teenage years. And therefore, was not aware that there are many people who dreamed a lot out there. When my friends asked me if I dream, I boasted that I don't dream and felt sorry for those who often dream. It was a funny rationale I had at that time. But I started dreaming more often when I was in my twenties, and amazingly, I could remember some, not all, of the dreams I had. I also started to journal them as soon as I waked up in the morning, because they often slipped off my mind if I do not record them. This is my personal experience, as I often regret for being lazy when I forgot those precious dreams.
as I often regret being lazy when I forgot those precious dreams. Just to share, have a notepad beside your bed so that you can jot down your dreams even when you wake up in the middle of the night. I had different types of dreams. Some are clear, some are not. Some are in colour, some are in black and white. Some are mute, some are audible, some are in series, while others are isolated. But most of the time, I could remember only in part, unless the dream is short. It's also difficult to remember every detail, and they often get blurry. I believe that dreams are given for a purpose, nothing coincidental or accidental. Dreams can be supernatural, i.e. divine, or revelation of our inner true state of mind. To me, dreams could serve as a way of communication, warning, foresight, or a way to understand the inner depth of ourselves, the real me inside. We need wisdom or discernment to differentiate meaningful dreams and those that came as a result of too much television or dramatic experience before sleep. Objects, people, animals, colours, numbers, etc. have symbolism and each of us would have to build up our own vocabulary and interpretation library because each of us had different emotions attached to various objects or people. For example, a cat may be cute to one, but arrogant to another. In order to bring success into your life that you've always dreamed about and that you truly feel you deserve, you must dream big. One of my most favourite quotes about dreaming big goes like this. You will never live a life beyond your wildest expectations until you first have some wild expectations. I want you to think back to when you were a kid and I bet you can remember some wild dreams you had. I know I did and I bet you did too, even if you say you cannot remember them. Unfortunately, as you're growing up, those dreams are killed by adults teachers and other adults of influence repeatedly, repeatedly telling you that you must be realistic and find jobs that will pay your bills and give you a good retirement. In other words, they were stealing your dreams from you and lower your expectations and not to mention your self-esteem and confidence levels as well. In order to achieve any levels of true success that you desire, It's going to be your ability and determination to break free from this destructible line of thinking that has brainwashed you all these years, that has gotten you stuck in the life you're now leading, and that is leaving you unfulfilled and unhappy and buried your dreams far back into your memory. Big success is created from having a burning desire to succeed, And that burning desire to succeed must be harnessed to bring your passion, drive, discipline and your determination to capture your dreams and make your dreams come true. It's your dreams that are the fuel that you will need to motivate you to push forward when things are not going your way and obstacles seem too tough to overcome and this will happen from time to time. It's your dreams that allow you to break from the pack and stand on your own from the crowd. However, if you do not follow your dreams, you're just part of the crowd and there will be a small part of you that dies from the lack of fulfillment you have in your life, from your non-pursuit of your dreams. It's your dreams that give you the fulfillment and accomplishment that you desire and the life that you want to live. If you've not already, you need to start dreaming again, and when you do, dream big. You need to start imagining the biggest dreams you can, that you wish to have fulfilled in your life, and not to worry about the size of the dream, just imagine it. It's your dreams that will inspire you, that will motivate you, and most of all, should scare you. Your dreams should make your heart pound fast, sweat break out on your forehead from nervousness, and a smile across your face as your breath is being taken away. 
If these things are not happening, your dream is not big enough. Daydreaming can have a bad reputation as a wasteful, idle, pie in the sky activity and an optional one. Here's the truth the ability to dream is a life skill and especially a critical business one. Our dreams carry us to the vision of what we want, they help us identify core truths. And they help us to relate ourselves and other people, and help us relate to ourselves and other people. These are common objections, obstacles, and oppositions to dreaming. Which ones can you relate to? Dreaming isn't realistic. If I dream about something, I need to make a lifetime commitment to it. I don't remember how to dream. Dreaming is for kids, not adults with responsibilities. What's the value in a dream? I'll only think about something that I can have. I have no idea how to dream. The thought of it makes me tense and stressed. I'm trying to dream, and it's not working. Dreamers are people who don't get anything done. Dreams assist us to form our identities. When we don't dream, we're cut off from an important part of ourselves, the unconscious mind that drives much of decision making and action taking. And the universe does want to help us bring our dreams to fruition. It's truly enough to say, This is my dream. What's the next best step? This request scares some of us. It can dredge up notions such as, What am I worth? Do I deserve to have my dreams come true? If my dreams come true, do I have to pay in some other area of life? Today's accomplishments are yesterday's dreams and imaginations. If you look around you at the tall buildings, yachts, aeroplanes, cell phones, television, radio, these were all people's dreams at one time. Our dreams are the starting point for any kind of success. As Albert Einstein says, imagination is the preview of life's coming attractions. Everyone talks about the importance of dreams and imagination. In an interview with Muhammad Ali, he was asked how he got to the place where he is today. He said that it's not good enough to know what you're doing, but you also need to have dreams and imagination. There was a study done in one of the colleges to watch students during their sleep through certain devices. Each time a student starts dreaming, they will wake the student up from his sleep, as the students were allowed to sleep only and weren't permitted to have dreams. After four days, the experts had to stop the experiment since all students became stressed and worried. As you can see, everything starts with dreams and imagination. Let me ask you what is your dream in life? What's the thing you want more than anything else? Travel around the world? Have a happy family? Perhaps you want to have your own business? Unfortunately, there are many great ideas that stay buried for two main reasons. Number one, people's effect on us. We get affected by people around us, such as our friends, neighbors, as family, and family members, when sometimes they ridicule our dreams and thoughts. How many times have you had a great idea, but someone close to you says it's better to give up on this idea and that you're not going to succeed? In short, you have to be careful not to get affected by the people around you who say you can't succeed. Number two, fear. The second reason that prevents you from achieving your dreams and your goals is you. How many times have you wanted to start some kind of project, but a voice inside of you keeps saying, No, I can't do this. I'm not going to succeed. Then, as a result, you gave up on your dreams and goals. Unfortunately, many times we don't follow our dreams because of fear. Awaken the dying dream. Start, take one step after the other, and don't stop till it's accomplished. Just like everyone else, 
On more than one occasion, you and I have had this wonderful dream. A dream to travel across the world and visit interesting places, to wine and dine with prince and princess, to be a worldwide known celebrity and spend your time as you please. A dream to one day write a book, publish it and sell it to millions of people across the globe or perhaps to be that celebrity chef. Your dream might even be to be the richest man in the world. Too bogus? Why not? Ever heard of the popular quote, if you can think of it, you can be it? Trust me, it's no lie. Everything you want to be all starts from the mind, your deliberate actions towards it, your level of discipline, how much dedication you have, and your resilience, amongst other things. Often times than not, though, most people whose dream it is to become the richest people in the world have the origin of their dream from a rather selfish perspective. When I say most, I mean over 95%. The richest men and women in the world certainly didn't start with a dream of being the richest. They set out to serve to put themselves and all of what they have to offer out there and reach as many people as possible. History has proven over and over again that it handsomely rewards service to humanity. Above all, you'll feel a great sense of fulfillment and happiness. Perhaps your dream is to finish university and be the best in your field or to start up a business and grow it to a multinational company. The reality is that the bulk of us are not living this dream. We're not even living close. And worst of it all, we stopped making efforts. Thinking about it now, we may want to ask, what happened? How did that dream die? We grew older. The economy got worse. Lesser money in circulation to go round. We stopped dreaming and we started accepting whatever the society has to offer us rather than demanding what we want. The society sold us the lie that we can't have what we want. Instead, we should settle for what we can get. I strongly disagree. I don't believe in conformity. I believe we can be whatever we want to be. What then do we do? Here's my approach. Identify something in your life that excites you. Let's say you're writing your first story in 10 years. Use that excitement as a springboard into a dream. If you amplified your excitement about your short story by 10, 100 or 1000 times, what would the dream be? A best-selling novel? Stop yourself from making dreaming a chore. You can't try to dream. You need to let it emerge in your mind, on paper or in the air. Dreams live in the spirit of fun and adventure. What if I could live in the house of my dreams? What if I could live in another country? What if I could become a consultant? Dreaming requires space. Go for a walk or a drive or a trip down the grocery aisle, without children. Do anything that allows your mind to free associate. It's important to remember that just because you dream something doesn't mean that you have to commit to it. A dream can simply be a dream. Notice little kids. They engage in one passion after the next. As soon as they've used up their passion, they drop it like a hot potato, and move on to the next passion without judging themselves. Barbara Scher, the author of Wishcraft and numerous other books, talks about how you only need to identify one passion to start dreaming. This is because passion begets passion. One dream will open the door to the next dream. Knowing this, we can let go of the idea that a dream needs to be the right one. Excitement cannot be overrated. If you feel excitement about anything at all, follow the trail and see where it leads you. There's probably a dream at the other end. 
When you dream, start to notice the feeling around it. Do you feel excited, scared, a combination of both? Excitement and fear, or a combination of both, is a sign that you are on the right track. There are two very important steps you must undertake when dreaming. Say yes to the dream. Understand that you deserve it. In saying yes to the dream, you are in fact saying that you deserve this to be a reality in your life. If you don't stand up for your dreams, then no one else will. Whatever you're dreaming, you're dreaming it because it's the life that was purely destined for you. Of course, you deserve it. Why wouldn't you? Saying yes to the dream means that you commit yourself 110% to the attainment of it. You understand that the yes starts the wheels in motion to move the dream from absent-minded wishing on the couch to full-fledged participation in making it become a reality. Everything in life has always started out as a dream from someone, and your dreams are no less of importance than theirs. So start dreaming again, and this time be a kid again and start dreaming big. Learn, learn, and learn. You cannot move into the realm of success without first learning how to get there. All successful people spend years learning how to perfect their craft and develop a mindset destined for success. When we were born, we are born in a world that is totally stranger to us. There are lots of things that we can discover about it. As we grow each day as a baby, we have devoted our time using the senses that we have: sight, hearing, smell, and touch. Years later, we began to walk and explore a bigger world to discover. We began to talk, walk, run, and recognize people around us. We are in a hurry to learn new things by that time. Then, several years later, we're now ready for elementary schools and meet some new friends. A school environment's new. There are a lot of things to discover and learn inside it. We learn how to read and write. High school followed years later, and we're now learning even greater and broader things. Most of the time, we feel as if we don't have enough time to deal with all this learning. New ideas and facts coming out every day, filling our brain continuously. We graduated high school and then proceed to college. Here. We're learning things specialized on the course that we want. Everyday classes equip us with much-needed knowledge to be familiar with the kind of job we want to have after graduation. Finally, we graduated college and found a stable job. But then, for most people, they stop learning at this stage. For them, they already have the job. Why bother learning more? And learning becomes a tedious task for them. The world's evolving so fast; lots of information's coming out every day. Every day is a modern-day survival, and only the fittest survive. That's nature's way of ensuring the best species will survive. If you stop learning, how are you going to compete in this world? We must continue to upgrade our skills and continue. To add new knowledge, it doesn't mean that if you're a carpenter, you're only limited to learn carpentry skills. The good thing about people is that we're capable of learning all the things that we can imagine if we can work for it. Having different sets of skills is better than having only one. That makes you different from other individuals. Learning something new is like a coconut. It's hard and a bit messy from the outside. But once it opens up, it brings a lot of sweet juice and fruit inside. Whenever we're asked to learn something new, a panic monster or a zombie gets over us to let us know that no, no, you, you can never do it. But once you get over that feeling, you'll definitely enter an incredible world of new ideas and plan. It will enhance your character, 
your knowledge, and on a bigger perspective, your personality. There are so many lessons every single day in your life, from the moment you were born to the day that you die. You learn from mistakes, surroundings, peers, family members, and friends. You also learn lessons from courses, schools, seminars, etc. When we were kids, we're constantly reminded by our parents to study hard, get a good qualification, and with a good qualification, we can get a good job, so that we can get a good big salary. Big salary means a lot of money. So you can see from here, at the end of the day, the end product is still money. But the sad truth is, no matter how high your qualification is. We still have to use our precious time to work for somebody else, just to earn that money. In conclusion, we exchange time for money. You work for money. Let's take a shortcut. Instead of taking lessons and end up working for someone else, why don't we use our precious time to learn how to grow your money instead? Use the money that you have and make it work for you. Given a choice. Would you choose between learning to get a better qualification so that you can get a better job and work till sixty-five, or learn how to be your own boss and make money, make money work for you and retire any time you want? I know I'm not that dumb to choose the first one. I'm tired of waking up early in the morning, being told what to do, when to take my lunch, when to go home. I want to be free. The second lesson teaches you the art of the financially intelligent. These lessons are out there, and the resources are available everywhere. It depends on you, how bad you want it, whether you want to learn it, use the techniques, practice it, treasure it, and then fire your boss. In order to get ahead, you have to keep learning and constantly upgrade yourself. There are so many lessons out there, and in our fast-paced environment, time is so precious and valuable. So the big question is, which lesson should I choose? Time is money, and we can't afford to waste it by learning unnecessary stuff. I'm sure you've heard people say that they're too old to go back to school. These people sometimes have the idea that they're not only too old for school, but too old for learning. That's just not true. We're never too old for school, and we're never too old to learn. A 93-year young woman was recently in the news for finally graduating from college. She never gave up on her dream of continuing education, and eventually succeeded in her goal, even though it took almost 80 years to do it. It's so easy to admire a desire to learn. But it's even more impressive when someone has the drive to make learning a priority in their life. Learning should not stop after high school or college. Striving to learn new things keeps your brain active and keeps you interested in what's going on around you. People who just stop where they are become stagnant and stale. Our brains don't stop having the capacity to learn. Most often. We just get tired of trying to learn and stop doing it. Other times, we get stuck in a pattern, and learning goes by the wayside. The truth is that if you make an effort to learn at least one new thing every day, you'll be a more interesting individual, and your mind will be more engaged and active. As a recruiter, I come into contact with candidates and job orders that teach me something new every day. The lesson I learned last week is that I should never stop learning, but rather soak up every piece of information, whether in print, audio, on television, online, bathroom wall, wherever I can gain new information. I'd better absorb it. I now realize that I never want to get to the point in life where I'm stagnant and no longer moving forward. I met a candidate a few weeks ago who I thought would have been fabulous for a particular position, but the manager felt he might be too advanced in his career. The reason that he thought he might be too advanced is because he was older, and the stigma that older candidates face is that they're too old to learn new technology. 
It was at that point that I realized that I better keep new information flowing through my grey matter, or else I might grow stagnant myself. This was a wake-up call for me, my aha moment, if you will. You see, there was a time, not so long ago, I honestly thought that one day I would be perfect in my thinking. I know it sounds arrogant, but let me explain what I mean by perfect. I thought that I would get to the point in my emotional maturity where every word that came out of my mouth would be filled with sage wisdom, every thought that came into my mind would be straight from God, and every action that I took would be perfectly orchestrated, and the exact same action that God himself would have taken. I'm not sure where that mindset came from, but suffice it to say, it was a mindset that would put me in a mental tailspin every time that I said something off colour. Not in line with a word, ugly words not included, or responded completely opposite of the way that I should have responded. When these failures in action occurred, it would set me back to square one, almost like seeing failure student will remain in third grade on a report card. Then I would have to start all over in an attempt to relearn what I already knew. I'd not even thought about my career and progressing in new technology or processes until last week when I realised that I would be learning and improving until the day I die. There are many ways to pursue learning. Reading is an excellent way to learn about something you may have always been interested in, but never took the time to get into. Buy a book on the subject. Try the library if you're looking to just dip your toe into the subject. Do your research on the internet, on your subject, and then decide how to proceed. If reading is the first step, the next step may be to take a class. Continuing education is offered in many places. Local community colleges, universities, arts or business centres, museums and churches often offer many types of classes. Again, the internet is a great place to do the research to find where you might find the class you're looking for. Another approach may be to join a group centred on your interest. The learning process won't be a formal one, but you'll have the opportunity to network with others who have interests that are similar to you. Learning from others is a great way to tap into the expertise of someone who's further along in the journey. Many times, this setting is much easier to learn in than a typical classroom. These different groups meet in many settings and are now found all over the country. If casual learning isn't what you're looking for, you're considering pursuing a degree, then don't shy away from the opportunity. Don't talk yourself out of it before you check it out. If you're older and have responsibilities, like a family and a job, it's a big decision to make. The decision does deserve a complete analysis, though. Make sure you look at all options when you're deciding on what program or school might work for you. Colleges have many flexible degree options these days, from online courses to evening and weekend classes. So, don't make assumptions about what might be available to you. Find out for sure and see if a program you like can work for you. The important point to remember whenever someone looks at life lessons learned is that every day is a new day and that learning is incremental. A new insight can easily be gained each day by looking at situations objectively. It's not that any one person has all the answers. Rather, the important one is that one can continue to pick up new ideas and behaviours each day to more fully understand and live life fully. Successful people never stop learning. Lifelong learning is the first step in becoming an outstanding performer. In today's fast-paced world, if you don't keep learning, you're not standing still, you're falling behind. One of my favourite quotes from Gandhi nails it when it comes to lifelong learning. Live as if you were to die tomorrow. Learn as if you were to live forever. 
He's right. None of us should ever quit learning. I have a thirst for knowledge and do my best to quench it through learning. I try to learn something new every day. Sometimes my learning is trivial. Sometimes it is profound. Regardless, I keep on learning. On days where I feel as if I haven't learned anything, I turn to a little book that I have called "Live and Learn and Pass It On." The subtitle is "People Ages Five to Ninety-Five Share What They've Discovered About Life, Love, and Other Good Stuff." I usually find something in there that satisfies. Here are a few of the learnings in the book that have helped me. I've learned that if you wait until all conditions are perfect before you act, you'll never act. I've learned that if you want to get promoted, you must do things that get you noticed. I've learned that ninety percent of what happens in my life is positive, and only about ten percent is negative. If I want to be happy, I just need to focus on the ninety percent. These are little life's learnings that I find helpful. On the other hand, I had a big learning the other day. I figured out how to podcast. I've been wanting to turn my blog posts into podcasts for a long time. However, I never put in the time that it takes to become proficient. I promised myself that I would learn in early 2019. On Tuesday, I spent about four hours figuring out how. It wasn't all that hard. The information I needed was on the web. Now I know how to podcast. Podcasting is an important technical skill for me. I had to learn it if I were to reach my target audience with my common sense career and life success advice. What important technical skill do you need to learn to stay current in your area of expertise? How can you learn it? I suggest you set a deadline for learning this skill, and then do whatever it takes to learn the skill by the deadline. All of the people I know who are committed to lifelong learning have several traits in common. They all are humble. They admit what they don't know. This is the first step in learning what they need to know. Question the status quo. They realize that because something is right today, it may not be right tomorrow. They know that doing things the way we've always done them is not good reasoning. Are intellectually curious. They truly want to learn and find learning fun, interesting, and stimulating. They see life as a journey in which they're constantly learning, are willing to try new stuff. They experiment and see what works. When things work, they use them. Are not afraid to fail. They see failure as an opportunity to learn. Just as they incorporate what works into their repertoire, they use failures as stepping stones to other experiments. A tolerant of ambiguity. Learning creates ambiguity. These people are willing to let go of past ways of doing things in order to come up with new ways of doing things in the future. The gap between the past and future can make for an uncomfortable present. Focus on staying ahead of the pack. They are early adopters of new technology and new ways of thinking. They realize that knowledge has a short half-life today. They keep learning to stay ahead. The common sense point here is simple: successful people are outstanding performers. Outstanding performers remain outstanding performers by becoming lifelong learners. They continually expand their knowledge in order to get out in front of the pack and stay there. Begin your lifelong learning journey by focusing on your strengths and working to improve them every day. Building on your strengths is easier than overcoming your weaknesses. When you build on your strengths, you can make incremental improvements. However, if you have a glaring gap in your skills, address it now. Don't wait to take necessary quantum leaps. What do you need to learn in 2019? How do you plan on learning it? Remember what Ben Franklin had to say: "An investment in knowledge pays the best interest."
Seek clarity in life. The need to know the reasons for lessons is one way you try to understand why you experience life challenges. But nothing happens to you without your direction, control, willingness, and participation. Every event and experience is part of the path of reconnection to wholeness, which you create for each lifetime. When you ask for answers, you place others, including Source, in control of your life path, in the hope that somehow what you receive will explain and justify the pain, doubt, confusion, and suffering that you experience. There is only one answer, and you will find it when you seek clarity first. But what you need to know in order to understand the reasons for your challenges and pain is clarity about your purpose and mission in creating them, the healing you desire, your continuing search for wholeness, and the transformation that you hoped to achieve with them. Without clarity, answers have no meaning or value. Because to have clarity, you must also acknowledge your power and the control you have over every aspect of your life. You walk around thinking you need to have more time and energy for your business. Many of your thoughts are filled with "Ugh, I forgot," and "I don't have enough." Time is your finite element that seems to evaporate when you have to prepare for what you've dreamed up next. Or when you need your team to crunch for another launch, the prospect of not enough sucks you into thinking in what I call an upside-down manner. The reality of time is that you lose focus on the task that you have started, and before you know it, you're down to the wire or have completely exhausted the time you are allotted. Your clarity around the project is diminished by the exhaustion of your energy body as well as your mind and time. Then, results are less than you desire. Clarity is a beautiful word because it gives you a moment to pause and think about a lake or ocean where you can see the bottom and whatever is down there. It's a feeling of lightness when you've made a soul-filled decision that you know is right, regardless of what others tell you. When you have clarity, you have it for fleeting moments, and then, all of a sudden, the energy that you've been sitting, swimming, and walking around in sets in. This is the exact time when clarity seems to evaporate. Clarity leads to success. One of the biggest hallmarks of successful entrepreneurs is that they actively seek clarity. Clarity, the way I mean it, is a clear vision for their business, a clear system to achieve their goals, and a clear idea of how they will overcome any kind of business challenges or obstacles. When I talk about a clear vision for your business, what I mean is that you must have a clear objective for your most desired business outcome. In my case, my business vision is to be the number one business coaching company in the world. Every business action I take is linked to this vision, enhances this vision, and uses this vision. Can you state your business vision as clearly in just one sentence? When I describe a clear system for goal achievement. What I'm really referring to are the actual steps and procedures you'll use to make your clear vision a reality. In my business, my main priority is to give the best mentoring I can to my clients first, and then my next area of focus is on building out my sales and marketing channels even more completely. I seek intelligent shortcuts and leverage the knowledge and talents of a group of top professionals, consultants, coaches, etc., to aid me in reaching my goals much more quickly. This is why my company continues to grow as quickly as it does. Can you state your goal achievement process in a couple of sentences or less? When I refer to having a plan to move past business breakdowns, I'm talking about having some strategy or plan of action for moving past temporary setbacks or roadblocks. 
If you aren't able to overcome your roadblocks easily and regularly, your business won't be around very long. Can you define your exact strategy for overcoming setbacks or failures? When you're reviewing your business, be sure to note the strength of your clarity of vision, clarity of systems, and clarity of a process for overcoming business hurdles. If any of these are missing from your business, you need to put these in place. It's usually easiest to start by generating a business vision, then creating the systems you need, and then deciding how you will get over any obstacles. Too many businesses are begun without these three factors in place, and this is probably one major reason why so many new businesses fail within the first five years. You don't need to be one of these statistics. Remember, the greatest businesses are built from the clearest visions. Clarity leads to success. I can teach anybody how to get what they want in life. Problem is, I can't find anybody who can tell me what they want. Mark Twain. Success in life is like holding a map going to a place you don't know. There's a good map and bad. Good maps may take you where you want to go. Bad maps will give you confusion and could not help you arrive at the place you want to go. Take this as an example. How are you going to build your dream house? First, you find an engineer. Second, team up with an architect to design what kind of house you want. The engineer will do the plans and layout. Draft it first by an architect into perspective, and finish by the engineer for plans, materials, and layout. Consult it to you. If you like it, then it's time to make the plans reality. Hire contractors for labor to implement the design drawn by the architect and execute the plan of the engineer. The house is done. So, it's so clear that your dream house is made based on clarity. Clarity gives you an idea on what you want in life, where you want to go, what you're going to do. Statistically speaking, out of a hundred people, only two know what they want in life. Whatever you're going to do now, it will lead to a certain destination. But the question is, where? Start asking yourself now: Is what I'm doing now taking me where I want to go? Is this what I really want in life? Could this give me the growth I'm seeking? Is this what I want to give for my children? The journey of thousands of miles starts with a single baby step. Every healing path is a journey in reconnection with your power, value, deserving, and worthiness. Any challenge or painful experience is a reminder that you are unworthy of joy, peace, and love, which is a decision you make through the ego. It's your humanity that creates the pain-filled path to reconnection, while spirit merely asks you to remember that you are already divine, powerful, worthy, valuable, and valued, loved, and whole. When you ask questions from the point of receiving clarity, you can learn where you've disconnected yourself. For source can never and would never disconnect from you. When you simply want answers, you make yourself a victim of your experiences. Clarity reveals the purpose of your lessons, how you created their deals, and what you wanted to atone for or resolve through them. Clarity requires acceptance of your power, and with it, the creation of your path, no matter how painful it has been. You can provide your own answers when you have clarity. Because there's only one answer to any question about your life path, which is a return to wholeness and reconnection to source. There is no other answer. Seek clarity and then use it to embrace the truth about yourself. You are already whole, connected. You are an emanation of source light, so you are already divine, and you are worthy of love and are always loved. The search for wholeness and connection can never be completed because you cannot receive what you already have, and you cannot be given what is already yours by your divine birthright. You are a body 
with a field of energy that surrounds you. This field is similar to a home that sits on a piece of land. The homeowner can either tend the yard, field, or land and make it beautiful, clear, and productive, or allow things to pile up. This is what has happened when you gain a moment of clarity, and then you feel like it's just out of arm's reach. Your field is filled with what I call poopy energy. This poopy energy is something that is built up over time and has become your friend and your enemy all at once. It's been there to help you heal and stay safe and to get to exactly where you are today. On the flip side, and there's always a flip side, it's also just like scar tissue in that it's hard and difficult to change. But know that you can change it. I'm also talking about the actual scar tissue. How I know you can move scar tissue without a surgery is through the use of energy. I've done this, and it has been wildly successful. The same principles apply to your life, health, and health of your business. That old scar energy must be cleared up and disintegrated. Many times, we think that the clarity is going to bring the result, and yet really, it's what we do to release those old energy scars that really make the difference to clarity. A slice of what I'm talking about regarding energy and clarity is below. Expand your energy, not just your vision. To be expansive in the traditional business and success sense is to think bigger, create a bigger goal, plan for bigger results. What I'm talking about is to expand your energy body. Yes, I did mean to say energy body. In the traditional world of words in business, we say bigger. What we really need to sustain in the realm of bigger is an energy body, an energetic system to sustain the bigger vision, mission, purpose and goal. Every time I work with someone who's struggling, I must first work with the energy body to basically prop them up until they can handle that on their own. The energy body is a container for all the is and all that is to come. It must reflect the overall bigness of a vision or else there will be struggle, ill health, difficulty making money, etc. Get real. Authentic, that is. Bringing your gifts to the world can sometimes take you into a vortex of always having the face of perfection on. There's a fine line between responsibility and over-responsibility. Taking responsibility is freedom and often brings about giant leaps in your growth, business, finances, etc. Over-responsibility is when you take responsibility for everything and everyone's feelings and results and cannot hold the boundary between the thin lines of balance. Getting authentic means that the core essence of who you are shines through in everything you do and share. Recognizing that self-awareness, accurate perception and firm resolution to a healthy state of authenticity and correct responsibility brings about those leaps in your business that seem magical. This is the gap that brings clarity to everything. These are the leaps that you've been working on manifesting, but have seemed just out of arm's reach. The magic often occurs when you walk that thin line and have authenticity in your heart, on your sleeve, and that shows up in your bank account. And that shows up in your bank account. It won't just show up in your physical bank account, but your energetic bank account. This energetic bank account is the one where the body sheds unnecessary weight, the mind gets creative, time seems to be your friend, and everyone is seeking your counsel. Create some space. How many things do you have on your desktop or icons on your computer screen that you no longer need? I bet there are things in your closet that you cannot stand or never will wear, even during Halloween. I imagine that there are even apps on your phone that are no longer relevant or you recall what they do. The point is, you likely have papers, projects, clothes, shoes, electronics that take up space. 
They actually take up space in your mind as well as your environment. I have made a commitment to keep my email boxes clear from clutter and place each item in folders so that I can reference them when I need. This extra space has actually allowed me to have more time and creativity. As you allow yourself more space in your mind and environment, you will allow more energy to flow into your body and brain. Monks live in simplicity for the very reason to create and be of the highest service, rather than be of service to things. The saying goes: "Have lots of cows to take care, and you had little time to take care of the things that are essential." Really, the ancient saying goes: "Have lots of cows to take care of, and all you're taking care of is your cows." Let go of the things that are taking space in your mind. In your body and in your environment, some of the things that take up space in your mind are guilt, anger, frustration, etc. These actually take up a great deal of time and space. Without just one percent of these, you'll find that you have much more time, space, and clarity. Why people fail to seek clarity. If it's so easy, why do most of us fail to seek clarity? Seeking clarity is an act of courage. You have to admit you don't understand. When you do this, the other person may judge you. You might trip their trigger. You might be perceived as confrontational. The other person may view your question as an act of resistance. If you will admit it, you may not really want to hear what the other person has to say. But without clarity, there can be no alignment, and without alignment, your results will be disappointing at best. If you're feeling confused, or if you're getting mixed messages, don't assume. Don't ask the one who can't do anything about it. Go straight to the person and ask the question. What do you mean? What do you really want? How can I know when I achieve what you seek? What if they blow up? What if they accuse you of resisting? What if you feel a little embarrassed? So what? You need to be clear about what success looks like before you can be successful, whether that's in your role as spouse, executive, co-worker, or employee. Seeking clarity is an act of courage. Now, go ask. Be courageous. Courage is not the lack of fear; it is acting in spite of it. Mark Twain. Courage is needed if you are to get the most from life. This trait is developed much like a physical muscle. It can be strengthened through constant training and in the decisions you make within your daily life. Courage is a psychological muscle that helps you face life's challenges and develop resilience to hardship. If you don't develop courage, you'll be stuck being ordinary. For an individual to be extraordinary, they need to have courage. This is what the lion says: "I may not be the largest, I may not be the smartest, but within me there is something that most don't have." That. Thing gave me my title, and I act accordingly. I have courage, and you have it too within you. That same courage, the courage of the cowardly lion. Do you remember the cowardly lion in the story of the Wizard of Oz? The lion went out in search of courage. What was it he learned? The story ends when he learns the simple fact that courage is something that is not found externally, but you have to find it within yourself. Courage means going forward without doubt. If you believe you have courage, you have courage. The lion found courage within himself. So can you. Today, it is a simple fact that we lack so much courage in the business world. As leaders, we have to ask, where is the courage? As leaders, we should be setting the example for the people who work with and for us. Where is the courage that we're supposed to be exhibiting to our teams and to ourselves? 
How can we expect the people who work for us and with us to have courage when we don't have it? Instead of courage today, what we exhibit is conformity. As Howard Hendricks says, the opposite of courage isn't cowardliness; it is conformity. A belief is something you will argue about. A conviction is something you will die for. You can't really live until there are things in your life which you were willing to die. Yes, Howard does take it to the extreme, but the bottom line is, as Winston Churchill says, courage is what it takes to stand up and speak. Courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. If you are a student of Churchill, you remember one of the great lines he said when he was in battle: "Bullets are not worth considering." I do not believe the gods would create as potent of a being as myself for so prosaic an ending. Wow, where is that courage that Churchill and other great leaders exhibited gone? Where is it gone? What has happened in today's world that we don't exhibit that courage? We're not cowards. No one is calling us cowards, but they might be calling us conformists. Why don't we have the courage to take on things we need to do to make changes we know are needed? This is one of the reasons we have lost our leadership in the world. We no longer teach courage, but instead we teach conformity. Yet people in the rising countries throughout the world are teaching courage. They are teaching you can do anything you want and you can lead the world. So, is it time we took some courage lessons? Isn't it time we set the pace and exhibited the courage we know we have? If you have had enough of the bad economy, if we have had enough just conforming to things. Then it is time you, as leaders, put up the courage to do something, to make something happen in your business, life, career, health, and family. It doesn't have to be some super extraordinary thing. You can exhibit courage simply by standing up for what is right. You can exhibit courage by simply making the decisions that will take you down the right path. You can exhibit courage by showing your team consistency of how you operate. You can exhibit courage to your team by being there for them and supporting them, backing them, teaching them, and helping them. I urge you this week to make a new commitment to courage in your business, life, career, family, and health. Help them as you move forward. Look inside. As the cowardly lion did, you have all the courage you need inside you. Learn from the lion attitudes. The lion is not afraid of doing what he wants. The lion is not afraid of going his own direction, while the others go a different direction. The lion is courageous enough to defend and fight for his life. He lives his life the way he wants to. People with the lion attitude have courage. Attitude is what you do, what you think, and what you feel about yourself. Attitude is everything in life, because whether you rise or fall, everything depends on attitude. People with lion attitude are courageous. They are courageous to stand for what they believe. They're brave to go a different direction when everyone else is going another way. They are willing to face their adversaries and challenges, even if they're scared. They do not run away. If you want to have the lion attitude, then you have to believe in yourself. You have to change your perspective of yourself from negative to positive, because you are your greatest strength and your greatest enemy. There is an African proverb that says, "If there's no enemy within you, then no adversary on the outside can harm you." Having the lion attitude begins with changing how you think about yourself. It develops when you think positively about yourself. It strengthens when you stop believing what others tell you about you. Use affirmations to make you think positively about yourself. 
I also had a poor self-concept of myself. I used to believe what others said of me. Some said I was a poor writer. Others told me I would never make it in life, and I believed them. I began to think that I was not good enough, that my writing sucked. I felt like giving up on my dream of one day becoming a best-selling author. But the moment I began to use affirmations, my writing improved terrifically. I saw myself in a more positive way. I now have the courage to write what I think of without the fear of failure, because until you try, you will never know how good you are. Choose to be a lion because you have a choice to make. Choose to be a lion if you're standing for greatness. People with the lion attitude get what they want because they are bold enough to fight. They are not afraid to accept that their future is dependent on the choices they make today. This is what Steve Jobs says: "Your time is limited, so don't waste it living someone else's life. Don't be trapped by dogma, which is living with the results of other people's thinking." Don't let the noise of others' opinions drown out your own inner voice, and most importantly, have the courage to follow your heart and intuition. That being said, the door for a better life is always open, but most people refuse to go because they know not what to expect if they should step out there. One thing is true: individuals who step out with courage to better their lives often do so. The courage is also in you to have a better life. Step out. To live a fuller life, you need to have courage. Many people have good ideas for their lives, but lack the courage to make it happen. So, why do people refuse to act or take action? It is a lack of courage. Simple. In today's society, most people are concerned about what is secure to them. And refuse to exercise what they could have accomplished if they should act. Many people choose to seek after security because of the uncertainty of an end result. Success takes a certain amount of risk, but you have to have the courage to take that risk. Courage is the medicine for someone who wants success and is fearful. Fear is false evidence appearing real. If you follow fear to take over your consciousness, you will develop bad habits such as procrastination, worry, doubt, and may want to quit even before you get started. It does not have to be that way. You too have what it takes to develop a character to overcome the belief of not being capable. Be cognizant of this. Quitting is not an option. We all have fear at some point in our lives, but what many people have done is act in spite of their fear. Some people have the fear of speaking in public, and that's often classified as the most feared thing to do. What individuals who wanted to speak in public have done is face the fear of speaking and do it anyway. They may fail at first, but they keep going until it is no longer there. Fear vanishes. In order to erase it, you will have to face it. Face your fears today, and it will soon be gone for good. It is the courage within the person that makes it possible for fear to no longer be present. Both could not occupy the same space. Just as how success is a process, courage is likewise. If you don't have it, it will take some time to develop. So, if you have a vision for your life, you will need to have courage. Well, how can I develop courage? Here are ten strategies to build your courage so that you become your best self and to endure the trials of life. One, complete one thing outside of your comfort zone every day. Build up your courage step by step. This goal can be both big and small. Some examples may include driving to work a different route or signing up for a public speaking course. The point is to do things that promote growth and positive risk. 
Push yourself a little more every day, and your courage will grow. This practice may be scary at first, but simply taking an action is the first step in building courage. As you try bigger and greater challenges, you will notice that you're accomplishing things far beyond what you ever thought you could. Life shrinks or expands in proportion to one's courage. Anand Nin. Two, prepare yourself ahead of time. You cannot always schedule the challenges of your life, but you can prepare yourself before such an event occurs. Get yourself in physical shape. If you had to run to get help for someone you care about, could you do it? If you had to pull someone from a car accident, do you have the strength to do so? Make physical exercise a regular part of your routine. Be persistent. The difference between an amateur and a professional is that the professional spends twenty more minutes for practice, while an amateur stops at five minutes of practice. You have to accept whatever comes, and the only important thing is that you meet it with courage and with the best that you have to give. Eleanor Roosevelt. Three, train your mind. When push comes to shove, the mind will be the key thing to get you through whatever challenge you face. You must learn to believe in yourself. You must develop that habit of building yourself up through positive affirmation. Use "I can" and "I will" language instead of weaker statements like "I'll try" or "I may." Tell yourself that you're someone who makes things happen. Courage is fear holding on a minute longer. George S. Patton. Your courage will grow according to your desire. If you don't have a desire to develop courage, then you won't. Sometimes the best way to get motivated to develop courage is to consider what will happen if you don't. Think of all the missed opportunities. How will your career and relationships be negatively impacted? How will you feel about yourself? On the flip side, ask yourself: What's the best thing that could happen if you do take the positive risk? What if you ask your boss for that raise? What if you made a full commitment to your spouse and put your whole heart into the marriage? All our dreams can come true if we have the courage to pursue them. Walt Disney. Five, stay away from people who have stinking thinking. Misery loves company. If your friends and family are keeping you from excelling in your life's best interest, then maybe you need to distance yourself from them to some degree. A full separation may not be needed, but you do need to at least consider setting better boundaries in how you spend your time with them. The secret is to not let their negativity rub off on you. If you're not careful, their influence will define you in a very limiting way. One man with courage makes a majority. Andrew Jackson. Six, be original. Don't be afraid to go first. Think outside the box. Speak up with your own twist as to how things could be done. Perhaps you know of a way to do old things in a new way. Too many people these days hide in the safety of sheepishness. Even if they have a great idea, they are afraid to come forth with it because of the possible ridicule and rejection from others. It is true that if you never try, then you'll never fail. But then you'll never know victory or defeat either. These are the seeds of greatness. You must learn to overcome the fear of what others think of you and your ideas. Think of all the advances that have developed over the past twenty years because someone had the courage to be original. Courage is being afraid, but going on anyhow. Dan Rather. Seven. Hold on to your core values. Moral courage is having the determination to follow what you believe to be right. Regardless of the cost to yourself or the disapproval of others, people of courage have strong core values, and they keep these core beliefs in mind every time they make a decision. When you make a decision, consider how it may affect your ability to look yourself in the mirror. 
Consider if your decision will hurt other people. Practice what you preach. Do not compromise on your values, even when it's more convenient or to save your own skin. Sometimes the biggest act of courage is a small one. Lauren Raffo. Eight. Develop the art of being poised. Courage is not boastful. People who demonstrate courage let their accomplishments speak for themselves. Most heroes do not see themselves as such. They believe an action needed to be taken, and they did what was necessary. Bravery is being the only one who knows you are afraid. Franklin P. Jones. Nine. Don't psych yourself out. Remember the acronym FEAR. False evidence appearing real. Do not let your fears become any bigger than you have to. Your imagination can either be your greatest asset or your biggest enemy. We gain strength and courage and confidence by each experience in which we really stop to look fear in the face. We must do that which we think we cannot. Eleanor Roosevelt. Ten. Read books and watch movies with tales of courage. These serve as powerful examples that can inspire you. I love movies in which the underdog rises to the demand placed before him. These stories can point you in the direction of how to carry yourself as you seek to be a person of courage. I've often thought, how would Braveheart carry himself in a situation like this? Instead of having to spend a lot of time pondering my challenge, all I had to do was consider the example set by the character from the book or the movie that had inspired me. He who loses wealth loses much. He who loses friends loses more. But he that loses his courage loses all. Miguel de Cervantes. Final thought: Courage allows you to think for yourself. When you have courage. You will come off the sideline and go onto the field. If you fear to fail, you fear to act. Action is what takes you to the next level. Let go. Act today. You cannot act yesterday, and for sure you cannot act in tomorrow. One is gone, and the other is not yet here. You have courage. It is within you. Create energy within yourselves. Successful people are people of energy. They have energy first thing in the morning, and they keep up their levels of energy throughout the day, and even into their evening. The more energy an individual has, the more they get done, and generally, the more positive they are as a person. Or perhaps, as a result of being more positive, they create the energy that they need. Who knows? But we will explore this topic together right now. Energy and perspective. When you look at the word energy, how does it make you feel? What are your associations with the word? I want you to look at it and read it aloud. Energy. If you feel charged and ready to get out there, then fantastic. However, I also understand that many people look at the word energy, and all that comes to mind is, "Whoa, I am tired." You may not think this is you, but let us have a little brutal honesty now. How many times have you been in a gym and looked at an upbeat fitness class that's happening through the glass window in the aerobic studio, and said that you just feel tired looking at them? Once again, I'm going back to the power of the words you say and the emotions that you attach to your words is what creates your life day by day as you go along. If any human being states that they feel tired just by looking at someone else exercise, it is a sure way to reduce their own energy each and every time. Thus, always proving themselves correct. Am I repeating myself here? But if you take another individual that you may consider being full of abundant energy, they may see the same thing, but say something more along the lines of. Wow, that fitness class looks awesome. The fitness class did not change. 
The class members did not start exercising vigorously just to put off one person, and then put big smiles on their face to impress another person. It all comes back to who you are, the words that you use, and what you decide to put out into this world. One big secret to having more energy and why you need it. To have more energy, we need to fuel our bodies and our minds. I was working with a group of business owners recently, discussing their goals and aspirations and how to plan for them all. I always begin with their vision for life, but inevitably we end up discussing the energy it takes to start, keep going, stay balanced, appreciate your achievements, and do everything else that's required too. I believe this is especially important for women. Because I believe this is fundamental to all aspects of life and to everyone, not just those in business. I thought I'd share my thoughts in this section. Remember, you need to put fuel in your car if you're going on a journey. When your energy is running low and you can't keep going, you could feel any number of these things: overwhelmed, tired, lacking enthusiasm, not feeling in the flow. Lacking empathy, intuition, or spirituality, what's the point? No slash low motivation. It's all just a bit too much. Things happen to you instead of everything falling into place. You can't hear yourself think, let alone that quiet inner intuitive voice. One step forward, two step back, and plenty more. If you feel like this or similar, or if you just want to ensure you never do, you can do something to help you have more energy. The secret is that you need to find the right combination of fuel to keep you going. It doesn't matter whether you have a massive life goal, a business idea, a busy family to look after, or anything else. We all need to look after ourselves first, in order to do all the things that life demands. Or that we demand of ourselves. I think there are four absolute essentials that no one can continue to function without addressing. Sleep. Are you getting enough? This is so important. Everyone's different, but we all need a decent amount of good quality sleep overnight to ensure we're functioning at our optimum. It helps us to process all the things that go on in our lives. And also to regenerate physically. Personally, I need seven and a half to eight hours sleep. Ask yourself: Are you getting enough uninterrupted sleep? If not, is there anything you can do to help with this situation? Hydration. There is a consensus that eight eight ounce glasses a day, about one point nine liters, will keep you hydrated, improve your skin condition, etc. There's also a school of thought that, as your body is a self-regulating system, you should go with the thirst trigger, i.e., when you're thirsty, have some water. There's also a conflicting opinion about what you should drink: just water, or does tea and coffee count? There's even one study that shows beer can count, but personally, I'm not convinced this is such a great idea. You can only go by what feels good to you. I personally know that when I drink two liters of just water, or a combination of water and fruit slash herbal teas a day, I feel more awake, have more energy, and sleep better. I'll be doing some more research on this, so keep an eye out. In the meantime, do you think you drink enough water? Be honest right now. I know some people who go all day without a drink. Is that you? What could you do to improve your hydration? Why not monitor it to see if it makes you feel better? Nutrition. Food is the fuel that keeps our bodies and our minds functioning. If we under or overfill our tanks, we won't perform at our optimum. We won't perform at our optimum. If we use diesel instead of unleaded, we could have problems. Do you turn to high fat? High sugar snacks to get you through the day. Do you eat out of boredom to procrastinate or as a reward? Is this the best way to fuel yourself for all the things you want to or have to do in your life? 
Often, the shortcuts will have long-term effects that we won't realize until it's too late. Lots of people say that they can't eat breakfast. I was one of those people once, a long time ago. However, I know that if I fuel myself correctly in the morning, I can get so much more done. This is especially important if I have a morning at the gym planned. Otherwise, I won't make it through the classes. What changes could you make to improve the nutrition that your body receives? Exercise. This may seem counterintuitive, but exercise really helps to improve your energy levels. If you can find the energy to exercise, eat good food. Then exercise will give you more energy to fulfill all the other things you want or have to do. It helps improve your mood. Gets your heart and lungs pumping, so you have more oxygen and nutrients being delivered to the cells of your body. You have more energy and stamina, and helps you to fall asleep faster and have a better quality of sleep. Just don't do it too late at night, otherwise you'll be buzzing. I mix things up and change my exercise routines regularly. I love training with weights, but the gym can be lonely, so currently I prefer classes. They're fun. They get you to meet people, and I think I work harder with a trainer in the room. I like high-impact cardiovascular training, but I also love yoga and dancing. So I have a real mix of exercise going on, at least four times a week. What can you do to add some regular exercise into your week? A brisk walk with the dog? What do you love to do? A dance class may be more appealing than a run. What happens if your car runs out of fuel? Make sure you top up regularly to ensure you have more energy to keep going. These are my basic requirements to keep myself energized. I don't always succeed in all areas, but I do know that if I feel a bit run down at any point, I'm missing at least one of them. There are two other, slightly less basic needs that I have, and I believe most people do. So I'm going to cover them briefly. Make sure you have enough alone time as well as human contact to help give you more energy. When I spend a lot of time continuously with people, especially if I'm training or running a workshop, I can eventually feel a bit drained. This happens for lots of reasons, including simply the physical energy it takes to participate in the event. I know that I need some quiet time to myself to regenerate and get my energy levels back to normal. Meditation is great for this, as is getting out in nature or even just a quiet cup of tea on my own without any other stimuli. Conversely, too much time spent alone can drive me a little bit bonkers. When I'm home-based and haven't had human contact for a while, I can feel a bit low and de-energized. This is when I need to get out and remember that I'm part of the human race. Text messaging and email doesn't really solve it, as it's silent, non-human contact. The gym helps. Combining this element with exercise is brilliant, but doesn't always fully fix the problems. There's not as much interaction as I need. Grabbing a coffee with a friend, having a good catch up on the phone, going to a social or business event, or rounding a few people up for a night out are always great ways to fill that connection with others again. Be honest. Check in with yourself now and again, and ask yourself: Do I have enough energy to fuel my life as I want it to be? Is there something missing? If in doubt. Try it out. See what happens. Have you ever thought you wouldn't go to that class or in that run, and then when you do, you tell yourself off for forgetting how great it makes you feel? Remember those moments. Leave yourself notes if necessary. Take the time to find your required fuel combination and keep topped up to ensure you have more than enough energy to fulfill all the things you wish to do in this life. Five keys to mastering your energy and your life. I remained quite reserved as a child when facing social situations. I was unwillingly placed in. This is how I conserved my energy until I was sure it was okay to share it. 
I remember accompanying my mother to visit her friends and meeting their children without immediately engaging, especially with those who seemed reluctant to connect with me. We'd first spend some uncomfortable time in the backyard or in their room, trying to figure out how to break the ice and have fun with each other. Once we found something to do, we'd play until we had to say goodbye. The next time we met, however, we'd usually go through a similarly resistant song and dance. Mind you, this didn't happen with my school or neighborhood friends. Those connections were a lot more natural and enjoyable. Awkward or forced situations seemed to add an extra layer of self-consciousness and caution. I guess I was supposed to have fun because it was convenient for my mum and her friends to have their children entertain each other. Don't get me wrong, it wasn't torturous. After all, I was creative and imaginative and loved playing, but it was a different kind of fun, like one of those experiences you manage to enjoy, or at least gracefully bear, because you have no other choice. For instance, I had an uncle who showed his affection by pinching my cheek which I honestly hated, but had to accept since there was no avoiding it. Back then, my life was largely controlled by the desires and actions of adults, and like everyone else, I internalized these interactions into mental patterns that in time became a second skin, what I call the sense of otherness. Placing other people's needs and desires first, or centering my self-perception on what they said or did, was an extension of my upbringing. At some point, I had to find a way to break free from all that, so my actions and interactions were no longer directed by a sense of obligation or fear, or the judgment of right and wrong, but fueled by real motivations emerging organically from within. Fear and obligation come from a wounded place that pushes you to behave according to someone else's expectations. It robs you of your inner voice and blocks your creative expression. Time stretches in relation to your energy engagement. Perhaps navigating life without your true voice reminds you of childhood, when things were simpler or you felt safe. Or maybe you unconsciously uphold the rules you were supposed to follow, Be as quiet and obedient as possible, and don't make waves, lest you'll be silenced or punished or unloved. But now you have personal dreams and goals to attend to. If your attention is focused on others and what they do, think, say, and more importantly, how they perceive you, you remain off-center. And it's impossible to be fully present or enjoy life when you're not centered, because you give your power away and reinforce past patterns that diminish your self-expression. To create a meaningful life, you must know your emotional terrain to develop flexibility and also take charge of your energy and time. Why? Because, in this physical plane, energy plus time equals your life. Energy always comes first, so if you manage your energy, managing your time according to your desires and priorities will be easier. Believe it or not, time stretches, or shrinks, depending on how present, or not, you are in what you do. The present is your place of power, because it connects you to your infinite nature, but it's very easy to get distracted by the ego mind with doubts and judgments or past impressions. The more focused you are, the more expansive your perception of time becomes, which translates into being more productive. Similarly, the more scattered your energy, the more exhausting and chaotic your endeavor, usually requiring more and more energy to complete. Mastering your energy means becoming self-aware and understanding why you do what you do, what are the real motivations behind your thoughts and actions, and whether they reflect self-love or fear. More often than not, you experience mixed feelings, and it's hard to tell which emerge from your inner voice and which come from your resistance to change and the fear to move past your comfort zone. Here are five key points to help you out. 
Be aware of your attention. Where your attention goes, your energy and power follows, expanding what you focus on. So, what are you mainly focused on? Be aware of your energy. Are you investing it in what gets you closer to or further from your goals? If the latter, prioritize and simplify. Be aware of your resistance. Recognize how it manifests to distract or deter you from moving forward. Self-doubt, guilt, dramas, chaos, illness, etc. Be aware of your time. How much time do you really invest in your goals? How much do you waste, and how? Again, prioritize. Be aware of your environment. It reflects your state of mind, so keep it clean and clutter-free to allow more energy to flow and support your endeavors. Yes, that includes toxic relationships. Nine ways to recharge your energy and spirit. Work overload, stress, worries. All these are thieves that rob us of our energy within. Getting up each morning to face a brand new day with new hopes and motives is quite a task. Though we are too used to it to notice the effort we are actually investing, there are times when a person feels too low and too drained to get up after a fall. It's times like these that a person needs a fresh start over. Which is not possible, or a good recharge of energy and lift up of the spirits. On second thoughts, why wait for a fall to realize you need to recharge? To lead a healthy and wise life, one must alter habits and lifestyle to avoid a nervous breakdown in the first place. A few tips to help you be a better person and improve your performance in life are mentioned below. Try to make use of at least a few. And you will see a difference. Honesty is the best policy. Lying is like quicksand. You unintentionally slip a foot in, and before you know it, you're pulled in completely. Imagine the discomfort and stress to live up to lies every day. Always be clear and honest with your thoughts and communication. It's easier to say the truth rather than making up a story and then trying to prove it right. Honesty saves up a lot of positive energy that could have been wasted while lying. Set your limits. Albert Einstein quotes: "The difference between stupidity and genius is that genius has limits. Dragging oneself beyond their power and will is quite exhausting. It's mentally and physically unhealthy to take on more than what can be handled." Set limits on time and effort put in. Make commitments that can be fulfilled within the comfort zone, and learn to say no or excuse yourself when things get too hot to handle. A date with yourself. Learn to give yourself a priority. Take out time for yourself and indulge in an activity or exercise of your liking. Spending time alone gives one an opportunity to think and heal. We're always busy with doing things and going here and there, just because we're expected to do so by other people. Amidst all the chaos and hectic routine, a little time alone rejuvenates our body and spirit. An hour or less each day allotted as personal time will be enough to clear out your mind and feel fresh. Connect spiritually. Spiritual connection and belief gives a person an understanding of its purpose in life. Take out time for meditation or prayers, or something that makes you feel connected to a spiritual relationship. It adds peace and passion to life and prepares you to face any hardship or difficulty without disrupting your spirit. Live and let live. Stay away from interference and criticism. No one's meant to poke in other people's business and lives, and in the same manner, do not let others interfere in your matters too. Family and friends, and those directly involved, are usually enough to handle matters. Unnecessary interference creates uncomfortable situations and burden on our mind. Too much commenting and criticizing can affect self-esteem and confidence. 
pushing the person away from the goal. Forgive and forget. Life is too short to keep grudges. Pain, anger, hatred gradually take over the happy feeling inside and leave a person full of hatred. It's best to let go of all the negative feelings and forgive people that have intentionally or unintentionally ever hurt you. The other person might not even realize your feelings for him, but those feelings will surely eat you up from the inside. Sharing is caring. Life is all about give and take. Health, wealth, family are all blessings from God, and as the saying goes, sharing multiplies happiness and decreases sorrow. Human nature compels us to never be satisfied with what we have. But stepping out of your shoes and seeing things from others' perspective will surely make us realize how much we have to be thankful for. Volunteer for help at shelters, food banks, senior homes, or other places where you can prove to be fruitful. It's not about money. Always being there for someone, giving company to a stranger, or helping someone in their work gives a wonderful feeling and earns a person some blessings too. Explore and venture. Excitement and surprise can fuel up a person instantly. The rush felt when going for a new adventure or doing something that excites a person can wash away all worries and stress for a while at least. New experiences give a fresh start to things, teach us a lesson or two, and add a little enjoyment to routine life. Right changes at the right time. Relations, friendships can go badly sometimes. No one ever means to spoil a relationship, but there are times and situations that make things worse. It's important to know when to let go or when to work things out. Unhealthy relations drain a person emotionally. Being tense and stressed all the time, thinking about how to go about things without getting into a fight and arguments, takes away all the positive qualities in a person. Don't be afraid to let go. Look forward to a better tomorrow. One door closed will open up many new doors of opportunity. Just be ready to step in. Your actions define who you are, and I'm not only talking about getting ahead in a career or looking after family and friends in your life. I'm talking about you, about going beyond all the outside drivel that is fed to us by the media and ideologies of our modern world about this diet and that diet. Take this fat-burning pill. Motion creates emotion. Move your body in a different way, and you will feel your emotion change. I ask you, how does a confident person walk? Walk the same way and become more confident. How does a fulfilled and happy person respond in a time of challenge? How can you respond in a similar way? To create energy, we must become energized. For that time where you feel defeated, that moment where you want to lay down and rest, I want you to ask what you really need at that time. Do you honestly need rest, or could you move your body even for a few seconds to get your energy back up again? If you move your body in a different way, or even speak with more enthusiasm, I'm sure you can amaze yourself how your emotion changes. Move in a dramatic way. Notice the dramatic change in emotion. Make a minor change in your movement, and notice the minor change in your energy. In doing this, to create the emotion you want, which will strive you forward, you create the motion first. Develop your productivity. There's only so much time in a day, a year, or a life. The ability to work efficiently within that time can boost outcome. Productivity results from a mix of factors: motivation, talent, training, work environment, support from others, time management, and even luck. Some people seem to be natural super producers; others look to daily exercises and good habits to help them get things done. 
productivity hinges on mental energy, a sense of motivation, alertness, and buoyancy. It often emerges naturally from work that one finds inherently meaningful or valuable. Researchers find that it can be cultivated through focusing on meaningful elements of a larger goal, or focusing on a larger, meaningful goal can help activate energy and drive for component tasks. Physical elements also play a role in fostering productivity. Exercising, eating healthily, and sleeping well can boost efficiency. People typically focus best for periods of 90 to 120 minutes. After that window, a break can allow the brain to refuel. A short respite, such as taking a walk or chatting with a colleague, can deliver another spurt of productivity. It takes time for the brain to disengage from one set of tasks and to switch to another. Technology today possesses an endless supply of immediate distractions. Avoiding them can help fuel productivity as well. What productivity is not? When you think of someone productive in your life, you may immediately picture a person who's busy all of the time. This individual is constantly moving through tasks, pushing deadlines, and seemingly trapped under a pile of duties that seems to grow each day. We often make the mistake of equating just being busy with being productive, but they aren't the same thing. When you're meeting the true definition of productivity, you won't be chasing deadlines or running five steps behind on everything you need to get done in a day, week, month, or year. It's quite the contrary. You'll probably be ahead of schedule. The bottom line is that we all have 24 hours in a day. Productivity is being able to make the most of them. And create lasting habits of achievement and fulfillment instead of chasing endless lists of tasks. In other words, work smarter, not harder. What is productivity to you? Why do you want to increase your productivity? The most obvious answer that will probably come to mind is that you'd like more free time to do the things you enjoy doing. If you're able to reach your goals sooner, that leaves you time to set and achieve other goals, whether that's relaxing with a book or learning a new skill. As a bonus, if you accomplish tasks with more ease and frequency, you'll see a decrease in life stresses. Rather than running around trying to get everything done, you'll see your duties completed in a timely manner. But productivity without passion is just checking goals off a list. Why have you set those goals in the first place? If you really want to increase your productivity, think about what's driving you to do so. Sure, you probably want to make more money at your job or be able to go on more vacations, but why? What's the hunger or purpose that's driving your actions? Do you want to be the best version of yourself? Do you want to take better care of your family, your community, or the environment? Keeping your ultimate purpose in mind will help steer you, even when the waters get murky. Look to others for productivity in action. We'd all like to succeed with less effort, but how can you calculate productivity, let alone increase it? Your first step is to find some models of what productivity means. And what it doesn't mean to you personally, as Tony says, success leaves clues. Failure does too. If you desire to increase your productivity, it begins at work. Model your success after a colleague noted for their productivity. Look for someone who's got a clear vision of their day, sets limits on their time, and even gets a project done early. Ask them how they design their particular structure. And if they're using any tools, you can start to design your own method based on theirs. By finding people that embody the type of meaningful productivity that resonates with you, you can start to visualize what increasing your productivity will mean for your life, both at work and at home. Turn productivity into a habit. It'd be nice to say. 
I'm making a change, and then it just happens with no further effort on your part. But better productivity, like any other shift in your life, requires some work on your end. It can take up to three months to form a new habit, whether that's creating a daily checklist of tasks to guide your day or building out a weekly gym habit. Once something becomes a habit, it becomes much easier to integrate into a routine. Soon, you realize that a task can become second nature. By turning productivity into a habit, you can achieve far more in your personal and professional life. Survival in the present times has become difficult due to the rat race everywhere. There's a lot of work around us, and we often take up a lot of work on our own shoulders. But not everyone is a multitasker, and we do have our limits. If you're given too much work to do, you will fail to accomplish them. You may complete them under pressure, but the quality of your work will not be good. Productivity does not signify quantity alone; it signifies quality to a great extent. It's better not to do any work rather than poor quality work. Keep in mind some points that will help you to increase productivity. How to improve your meaningful productivity? Apply the principles of Japanese psychology to help you do what's important. When it comes to doing things that matter to you, two things can get in the way. One is procrastination. You know what you need to do, and yet you struggle to do it. Research has found that we procrastinate either because we dread the task or because we're not sure how to do it. Either way, we put it off until a later time. The other obstacle to meaningful productivity is a subtle and more pernicious variant of procrastination. Instead of obviously putting off a task, you busy yourself with activities that you feel more comfortable doing, what I call virtuous avoidance. You need to write that article, but instead you return to emails. Rather than working on your book, you update your budget. And while others see you as a model of productivity and efficiency, you know you're not doing what's most important. If you'd like to do more of the things that matter most to you, here are three steps that you can use to help move you in that direction. They come from my discussion with Greg Kreck, an expert in Japanese psychology and author of *The Art of Taking Action*. Lessons from Japanese psychology, who has helped thousands of individuals build the lives they want through his writings and workshops. One, the rule of three. Many of us are better at meeting our most pressing deadlines than doing what's fundamentally important," writes Dr. Alice Boyes in the Harvard Business Review. Accordingly, you end up prioritizing things like reaching inbox zero over less urgent but more valuable activities, like investing in your training for work. The solution is to focus your efforts before you actually start to work using the rule of three. Identify the three most important things that you need to do," said Craig, before you actually get into doing anything at the beginning of the day. It's crucial to do this practice first thing in the day before getting sucked into activities that may or may not be top priorities. Keep in mind that the most important things are often not the easiest. They also might not be urgent. Sometimes those things will have deadlines, and sometimes they won't," said Craig. Putting together your book proposal, for example, may well have no deadline. If you rely on a sense of urgency to do the things that are important to you, you'll probably never end up getting to them. Build up your schedule for the day around those three things," advised Craig. By the end of the day, if you've gotten nothing else done but those three things. Then you've succeeded because you've done the most important things. This approach can free you from the feeling of being on a treadmill, constantly in motion but not really getting anywhere. Action step: Take a minute now to set your three priorities for the day. What's most important for you to accomplish so that you'll know you've spent your time well? Planning important activities is a crucial step. 
but how do we find the discipline to avoid sliding back into activities that are easy and enjoyable, especially when the three things we list are difficult or we're not sure how to get started? Where do we find the discipline to do what needs to be done? Two, ask what needs to be done. The second step is to focus our attention on just that by asking ourselves what needs to be done. This seems like an obvious question, and yet, if you listen carefully, it's likely not the one that's driving your actions. Most of the time, we're asking ourselves instead, "What do I feel like doing?" Craig gives the example of sitting down to write something and staring at a blank page, which can trigger emotional discomfort even among professional writers. If you let that emotion guide your actions, you'll probably do something like check your emails or visit a news website, anything to feel more comfortable. As a result, your productivity will drop. Asking what needs to be done, in contrast, centers your efforts on what's important and on the priorities you set with the rule of three. By sticking to these three things, said Crack. We avoid working from a feeling state and gravitating to the things we feel like doing, while we avoid the things we don't feel like doing. This approach offers a fundamental shift in what we're aiming to accomplish. The outcome we're hoping for is not a change in our feeling state, said Craig, but the accomplishment of an important purpose in our life. Thankfully. We can accomplish our purpose even when we're still feeling uncomfortable emotions like anxiety or depression. As a result, we no longer have to change how we feel in order to do what matters to us. The real goal is to coexist with that feeling state and still do what you want to do," said Craig. You can move from a feeling-centered approach to life to a purpose-centered approach. Action step. Write down the question that you want to guide your actions today. For example, what needs to be done, or what's really important for me to do. Place it somewhere visible while you're at work. Three, focus your attention outward. Shifting our attention away from our internal feeling states is easier said than done. We're used to taking stock of how we're doing, taking our emotional temperature. And are even encouraged to do so as part of self-care. Most of us are very good at self-focused attention," said Craig, "as a habit that we've developed over our life. While it can be useful to know how we're doing, a focus on ourselves has obvious downsides. It gets boring for one thing. It can also get in the way of your goals, especially when an obsessive self-focus leads you. To prioritize feelings over doing what's important to you, most of us wouldn't feel satisfied to look back on a life that wasn't dominated by managing our emotions at the expense of other experiences. The antidote to habitual self-focused attention, according to Craig, is as simple as learning to shift attention away from ourselves and onto the world around us. This shift can bring welcome surprises, including getting engaged with the miraculousness around us," said Craig. Immersing ourselves in the present moment and what's actually going on is a rich experience. And not uncommonly, focusing attention outward leads to pleasant emotions like joy and serenity. Of course, if we make those emotions the goal, then we're back to the old habit of letting our emotions rule our actions. But we can allow these experiences to emerge as byproducts of an outward and present focus. Action step: Practice directing your attention outward by turning in to subtle sounds you're not usually aware of. For example, your shoes as you slip them on. An orange as you peel it, or the wind chimes in your neighborhood, adapted from the CBT deck. Five ways to manage time and increase productivity. Increasing productivity is very essential if you want to accomplish your daily laid down tasks, remain competitive in your industry, since your productivity determines how successful you become. 
you can improve your level of productivity and increase the amount of work you accomplish every day. If you need to increase how productive you are, here are some exceptional tips that will help you improve your productivity and achieve the goals you desire. One, make a daily plan. To be productive throughout the day, you need to have a daily plan that guides all your daily activities. This is an important tool in increasing productivity. The daily plan will help you know the activities you're supposed to do each day, their order of importance, and when they are to be done, such that by the time the day ends, you will have completed each of them. Create your daily plan the night before, so that when morning comes, you begin implementing it. This is the most important tool in increasing productivity. Two, split big tasks into small bits that are easy to complete. Big tasks are always hard to work on, and often people don't know how to start doing them. For you to increase productivity, you need to split big tasks into small bits that are manageable, and decide what part must be done first, next, and the ones to follow. Then start working on the more important parts. Splitting big tasks is important in increasing productivity, as you will be able to work on several parts of a task in bits without it overwhelming you. Three, deliberately prioritize. Rank all the work you intended to do according to their importance, with the most important task getting the first priority. This is very important in increasing productivity. So that the most important things that cannot wait are done first, and should you not be able to carry out the tasks at the bottom of the list, you will have done the important ones. Four, block all forms of distraction. To achieve the most in a day, one must choose to focus, without which you will fail. Increasing productivity requires one to block all the things that cause distraction. This can include signing out of your mail, turning off your phone, or put it on voicemail, and even turning off your IM to enable you to complete the task you're working on. You can also use a "Do Not Disturb" poster or tag so that people don't distract you. Five, time each task you're doing to avoid interrupting your work stretches. By setting a timer on specific tasks, you will be able to focus your energy and time on that task, knowing that you only have a set specific time to accomplish it. Try this by setting your timer for just thirty minutes or one hour, and see how much you will be able to accomplish within that time. Increasing productivity requires that once you set time for a specific task, you stick to that activity. Until that time lapses, six. Retain a positive attitude. A positive attitude is essential in increasing productivity, so you must always be positive and keep looking at the bright side, no matter how many times you fail to achieve your goals. With a positive attitude, you will be able to think clearly, identify solutions that will work for you, and be able to get things done. These are some of the working tips for anyone interested in increasing productivity. The pillars of productivity are mental energy, physical energy, and motivation derived from meaningful work. Simple strategies can support these overarching needs, prevent procrastination, and boost productivity. Identifying priorities and accomplishing products that are most important or most meaningful. Can help lead to a productive session. Creating a schedule for the decisions that need to be made and tasks that need to be completed is also useful. Responsibilities that seem particularly onerous stand to benefit from being broken into small, incremental steps. A move that can alleviate feelings of stress and inspire a sense of fulfillment that spurs taking on the next task. Perhaps most important is focusing intently for a period of time, and then taking a break, creating an opportunity to rest, indulge in potential distractions, and prepare for the next burst of productivity.
Make sacrifices. We live in an upside-down world. What could normally be termed success comes via an opposite media: sacrifice. We get more for less. Well-intentioned deeds have no basis in truth unless they cling, in some form, to the concept sacrifice. Sacrifice is courage, tenacity, humility, joy, and peace, all rolled into one. It's a package acknowledged at the award ceremony, and that to the person least desiring any award. The qualities of forfeit and surrender are not apt to become us. Generally, we don't want to lose a thing we can keep, or give something up that we can have. That's why we find achieving anything of real worth in life hard. Sacrifice doesn't come easy; it cuts against the grain of life. It's like we need to defy gravity to cooperate with its elusive power. Sacrifice means to forfeit one thing for another thing considered to be of greater value. The concept of sacrifice is interesting, because people often do not want to sacrifice anything, even though, by definition, they should be getting something of greater value in return. What are you willing to give up? What will it take for you to get to the next level? Success cost, and to be successful in your business, you will have to let things go. To build wealth, you have to change your spending habits. To lose weight, you have to change your eating habits. That calls for sacrifice. People don't want to sacrifice. They want it all by gaining everything without losing anything. It doesn't work that way. To learn how to swim, you have to jump in the water. To learn how to ride a bike, you must be willing to fall. To be successful in business, you need to work. That means sacrificing time, money, and your energy. Entrepreneurs will work 80 hours per week to avoid getting a 40-hour week job. Now that is sacrifice. Let's look at it from a chess perspective. In chess, it's common for a player to sacrifice or sack a piece or pieces. Usually, they're giving up material pieces for something of greater value, a better position. Sacrifices can be the way a player tears down his opponent's defenses, or might be the starting point for a crushing attack. Without going into too much detail, there are two types of sacrifices in chess. A pseudo sacrifice and a real sacrifice. Pseudo sacks are seen frequently. These are when a player gives up material but immediately gains the advantage they sought. In these situations, the player already knows that the sacrifice will gain them an advantage before they ever do it. No guts are required for pseudo sacks; just the ability to see them when they present themselves. Real sacrifices are different. These occur when a player gives up material for the hope that it will ultimately lead to an advantage later. Real sacrifices are rarer and are not guaranteed to lead to anything good. In fact, real sacrifices frequently lead to a player losing an entire game as he finds himself down a piece with no compensation for it. The ability to make real sacrifices that lead to an advantage later in the game only comes with practice, a sufficient skill level, and the guts to actually trust that skill. A player who's not confident in their abilities will never be able to convince themselves that a sacrifice is worth it when they cannot immediately see the benefit. A good question that arises from this information is. If sacrifices are not guaranteed and only occasionally work, why would anyone do them? Easy answer: because sometimes sacrifices are the only way to achieve the ultimate goal of chess, to checkmate your opponent. Just like in chess, in life we all face situations where a sacrifice might be in our best interest or the best interest of our family. Also, like in chess, we often have opportunities for both types of sacrifices. Pseudo sacrifices are still easy 
even in real life. Staying late at work one day to have more time on the weekend does not require any big step of faith. This type is easy for the same reason it is easy in chess. The advantage gained is relatively immediate and can be known before the sacrifice ever takes place. We all make pseudo sacks frequently in our lives, but are we making real sacrifices? Do we have the guts to give away something of value now for the hope of something better? Real life, long-term sacrifices can be very hard to perform. First off, we have to have our goals prioritized. Making worthwhile sacrifices will be impossible without specific goals in mind. Next, we must identify the sacrifices that we believe will lead toward our ultimate goals. Finally, we must trust ourselves enough to make these sacrifices. Once we complete these steps, we might find ourselves sacrificing our position at work, with the hope that it leads to a better relationship with our children. However, just like in chess, real sacrifices have components we do not always understand and plan for, which can turn a sacrifice into a total loss. This leads to the same question as before: If sacrifices are not guaranteed, why make them? It has the same answer because sometimes they are the only way to reach our ultimate goals. In chess, the entire purpose of the game is to achieve checkmate. That's it. With that goal in mind, sacrificing everything except what is needed for checkmate is a perfectly reasonable way to play. While life is more complicated than a chess game, this idea can be used in our everyday life as well. Once we know what our ultimate goals are and how they're prioritized, we can sacrifice whatever's necessary to achieve them. The law of sacrifice. What would you sacrifice to achieve your goals? When people think of sacrifice, they think about giving up something. However, this is only half the story. The law of sacrifice decrees that you give up something of a lower value in order to attain something higher of a higher value. Expressed in these terms, you can see that applying the law of sacrifice to your life is about gain, not loss. The proper application of the law of sacrifice will cause you to advance in life, not regress. And people generally want to advance in life. People want success. But all too often, they're unwilling to give up simple pleasures in life, even on a temporary basis, in order to achieve their goals. Take television, for example. Multi-Oscar winner and Hollywood mogul Daryl Zanuck said in 1946 that television wouldn't catch on, as people would soon get tired of staring at a plywood box. At least he was half right. Nowadays, the plywood box has been replaced by high-definition plasma screens, and thousands of TV channels are in existence. Not bad for something predicted that it wouldn't last. Many people wake up with their television and go to bed with their television. Some people have television in just about every room in their home, including the bedroom and bathroom. Yet one of the people's biggest complaints regarding pursuing ambitious goals, e.g., starting their own business, is that they don't have time. It's estimated that the average American child spends more time watching television than attending school, and that in most households the television is on an average of seven hours a day. Now, granted, not all television is bad, but do you think that people who have their television on for hours on end are being particularly selective about what they watch? What if a person were to stop watching television for just an hour a day, and replace that hour with an hour of personal development, exercise, studying new skills, or starting a new business? Even that small investment in time. Consistently applied would yield great dividends. The thing is, every moment of every day you're trading your life because what you choose to do in each and every moment is a trade-off between that activity and something else, and you cannot regain the time you invest 
or lose. The question is, are you effectively applying the law of sacrifice to your life so that you are trading your life for something of value, or are you just frittering away your life? No one who has ever achieved anything of any great significance has done so without making sacrifices. For instance, internet marketer Matt Barkuk has made some big sacrifices in his life, and one of those sacrifices involved his mother. When Matt was 26 years old, he decided to pursue his dream of becoming a millionaire, a goal he had identified for himself since he was just 12 years old. He recognized that he had to get really focused if he wanted to achieve this goal, and this would necessitate that he eliminate anyone from his life, at least until he completed his mission, who would not be supportive of or instrumental in him achieving his goal. So, he went through his cell phone and deleted anyone who didn't meet these stringent criteria. His own mother didn't meet the cut. As he explains, One sacrifice that I made was that I deleted my mother from my cell phone. And the reason I did this was not because my mum was negative to me. A lot of us have these negative conversations in our head, or these little gremlins, and it was always my mother in my head telling me, Matt, you can't do that. I figured that if I could stop talking to her, then I might be able to control that conversation in my head. Matt Bacak. Naturally, at first, his mother didn't believe he was serious about him shutting her out of his life, but she soon got the message when her attempts to contact him went unanswered. In turn, Matt Bacak's mother had to make her own sacrifice and grant her son the space he needed to become the millionaire he so desired to be. Fortunately, Matt Bacak achieved his target before the end of the year, which coincided with his birthday. So as you can imagine, that year was pretty special for a million and one different reasons. Charles de Bois said, The most important thing is to be able at any moment to sacrifice what we are for what we could become. So the question is, how will you apply the law of sacrifice to your life? What are you willing to sacrifice in order to become the person you desire to be? Improve your focus. Focus is so powerful, it can be used to cut steel. With a power as low as 800 watts, hardly enough to heat the average room, a light source can be focused to form an intense pinpoint of energy less than one millimeter in diameter, which contains enough energy to cut through sheet steel with high accuracy. This is a wonderful testimony for the power of focus. Scattered energy produces little, if no result, whereas very carefully focused energy will produce amazing results. Focus determines our future. Tony Robbins can be quoted, What you focus on consistently, you tend to manifest in your life. Chris Howard can be quoted, Where attention goes, energy flows, and results show. Focus starts in our mind, and then shows in our behavior. Focus is not only in our mind, it is in our actions. Our mind creates the actions that we use to produce our future. Our brain processes massive amounts of information every moment. Our brain takes in around 2 million sensory inputs in every second in the form of sights, sounds, touch, tastes and smells. Of course, that is not our experience though. This is because we cannot process that much information, so our brain uses filters to delete, distort or generalize the sensory input into about seven internal representations or chunks that our brain can find useful. To reflect this in neuro-linguistic programming terms, NLP, the map is not the territory. In other words, what we see is not a complete representation of what is going on around us. That raises the question, what are we missing? Could it be the next amazing opportunity? Could it be a danger approaching? Could it be how blessed we already are? Could it be the acres of diamonds that we have right beneath us? 
you get what you focus on. As more eloquently stated by Tony Robbins and Chris Howard in the above quotes, you get what you focus on. Why? Because we've conditioned our brain to delete, distort, and generalize. Imagine you're in a dark room with a torch and need to exit the room quickly. If you've been taught to shine the torch at the floor when you use a torch, all you will see is the floor ahead of you. As you walk forward, you soon bump into a wall and have no way out. If you've been taught to rapidly wave the torch up and down and all about in random movements, you may see lots of the room, but still may miss finding the door and the window that you could use to exit. Both these examples are extremes, yet are more common than you think. How often have you met somebody who proudly states, "We've always done it this way," or somebody who jumps from one great idea to the next every day? How many of you have seen this behavior in your own life? I know it's helped me back a lot in the past. Where you shine the flashlight of focus determines what you see. We will deal more with the science behind our thoughts and behaviors at another time, but for now, let's just think about two key points. If you try to focus everywhere, you scatter your energy and potentially miss the true best opportunity for you. If you stay focused on the wrong thing, you will get the wrong results. It has been said that it is crazy to think that you can keep doing the same thing and get different results. Let's turn the above points around. If you place your focus in the right place, you will concentrate your energy and create the results you desire. Focus, as it relates to our mind, is vital to create the correct focus in our mind. For example, if you focus on poverty, then you will tend to manifest poverty. Focus on prosperity, and you will tend to manifest prosperity. If you focus on sickness or disease, you will tend to manifest sickness or disease. Focus on health, you will tend to manifest health. If you focus hatred, you will tend to manifest hatred. Focus on love, you will tend to manifest love. If you focus on boredom, you will tend to manifest boredom. If you focus on fun, you will tend to manifest fun. What do you focus on most of the time? In spiritual studies, focus is known as the power everyone wants to develop higher than others. The reason is, like in a hierarchy in the workplace, where the boss on top has the power to control others' daily goals in the workplace. Likewise, in the world, the most powerful person is the one whose focus is highest in intensity. This is the reason why so many esoteric sciences tell us that sages have been trying to increase focus for billions of years. If we take two beams of light and converge them (inverted V), we can say that the two beams are working in coherence. The point at which the two beams converge can be called being focused. If we take both the beams of light and completely diverge them, they can actually become a straight line. Open the V. Now the beams are divergent. So, how does this knowledge help us? In no matter whatsoever till now. Read on, and it will make sense. The focus point always needs to have an objective or an outcome stored in it to make any difference in our lives. So, to say, if we're outcome focused, we can call ourselves focused. We're daily focused on the outcome of the result, which is guided by positive and negative expectations. Hence, we're focused every minute, every day, every week on some outcome. Sadly, most of these outcomes are negative outcomes. The good news is that whatever is the subject of our focus will get converted into reality by our own unconscious actions. The bad news is that when the subject of focus is negative, our expectation of negative is mostly stronger than the expectation of positive. We're unfortunately intensely focused on the negative goal. When it comes to a positive goal, there's always something that comes in the way. 
It has been known that if we can intensely focus on any goal, we can achieve it, and unconsciously, other people will help us achieve our goal. The universe will conspire to give us what we want. However, this is not exactly true. Whenever we focus on the goals which we want so badly, we experience something called scattering of focus, wherein distractions and negative blocks reduce the intensity of focus and delay the achievement of goal, or altogether cancels the goal. You must be thinking, what can happen if I can reduce this scattering of focus? What will happen is that not only will you achieve your goals much faster. And with the least amount of struggle, but also you will start becoming unconsciously more powerful over people who have lesser intensity of focus, and you will unconsciously control and guide their goals in a way that everyone will unconsciously help you achieve your goals. When we voluntarily concentrate on any goal, the so-called executive center in the front of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, is in charge. But when something distracting grabs our attention, there's a signal originated in the parietal cortex toward the back of the brain. While concentration occurs at lower frequencies, distraction is occurred at higher frequencies. So, distraction, being a survival tool, immediately impacts us and reduces the intensity of the V beam. A lot of products teach us to increase focus. But very few teach us to reduce scatter. The moment we're able to reduce scatter, our focus automatically and effortlessly increases to the next level. I can guarantee that if you put five percent of the efforts of what you have dedicated to increasing focus, you will radically improve your results and change your life faster than you can handle it. The three levels of focus. From talking with my personal development clients, I've discovered that there are almost as many versions of what focus is as there are people. Authors like Eckhart Tolle explain that focus is all about tapping into the power of now. That focus on what you're doing will lead to happiness and success. And sure, you can see that in action on your TV screens. Watch how top sports people focus on just the task in hand, and how they even have routines or silly rituals to get them in the zone to be at their most effective. But this here and now focus is only a small part of a much bigger picture. Those guys on the sports channels haven't got there just by focusing on whatever they happen to be doing in whatever here and now they find themselves in. To be successful, focus needs direction, and all these guys are driven by what I might describe as strategic focus. Like onions, focus has layers. Through my work with my clients on my personal development workshops, I have come to the conclusion that there are three levels or layers to becoming truly focused. The three steps. That you must take to enable you to learn how to focus and direct that focus in a productive way. Strategic focus. Simply focusing on the present moment is highly rewarding. Research confirms that those who know how to do it are effective and productive, and as a result, happy and content. But while only focusing on the present moment produces those kinds of results, a life of focusing on now can lead to an existence of aimless bliss. I have no problem with bliss; it needs to become an integral part of everybody's daily life. However, I do see a major problem with wandering around aimlessly. If you're like me, you've got to put bread on the table each and every morning. In other words, your focus must be practical. If you're like me, you've got other people depending on you to be practical, so some altered state of mind bliss is simply not on. What I'm saying is that your moment-to-moment focus, which I'll deal with later on in this book, needs direction. You'll find that this direction is often referred to as goal setting. However, the problem with goals is that they might just result in you living your life of perpetual dissatisfied expectation. 
Of course, that presupposes that you've actually established the correct goals. As normal people, we've little or no perspective on what's best for us. So it's best not to cast your goals in stone. Give the expectation that the power will make you happy and, by definition, if you don't get it, you'll be unhappy. In other words, you've got to focus your mind on how you'd feel when you've got it all, whatever it all might be. What would it look like, feel like, and sound like to be on the right life path, whatever your very own personal right path might be? To put it another way, you should make sure that your focus at a strategic level is touchy-feely captivating your subconscious mind with an excitement that drives you to be more and more focused on a daily basis or, ultimately, on a moment-to-moment basis. Regularly paint these touchy-feeling mental pictures for yourself by handwriting them often. They should be handwritten because handwriting captivates and motivates the subconscious mind. This is how you should set your strategic focus. Operational focus. Once your subconscious mind knows the direction you're headed, you need to get your head around the important things that you need to do that day. There's a world of difference between important and urgent, And all too often, we find ourselves being overwhelmed by the urgent to the extent that we're left with no time to do the important. Or even worse, we waste our time reading emails that nobody was meant to read, gossiping with others about bad news, channel hopping, talking nonsense on Facebook, you name it. We're great at finding ways to do things that are totally unconnected to the life that we want to have. Operational focus means that you know the difference between doing the right thing and wasting your time and energy. You'll only realize whether or not you're doing the right thing if you stop yourself at various points during the day and ask yourself the question, am I doing the right thing? If you are, cool. If you're not, stop it and start doing the right thing. Task-based focus. Once you're doing the right thing, you need to do it right. All too often, when we set about doing the right thing, we get easily knocked off course. By distraction, by others wanting to waste our time, by taking on other people's problems, by not saying no. Task-based focus is all about fully immersing yourself in whatever it is you're doing. Unfortunately, for the normal mind, this is not something that comes naturally. In fact, it seems to only happen by accident on the very odd occasion that you find time flying because you're actually having fun. You need to learn how to focus moment to moment. By far the best way of learning to pay undivided attention to the present moment is meditation. Meditation disciplines an otherwise undisciplined normal mind. When you meditate, you engross yourself in what some or all of your five senses are telling you. In fact, you discover how easy it is to simply turn off distraction and become exceptionally focused. In other words, the right thing to be doing every morning, the one thing that will ensure that your day is directed by your strategic focus, is to meditate. The Secret of Successful Focusing In these times, it can be difficult to focus with all the myriad of distractions that pound upon our senses. You may be writing a report when the phone rings, or you may remember that an important email was to be sent to you, and you just have to check and find out. If you're scattered all over the place, something's going to suffer. I don't believe in multitasking. To focus is to single task until you get the job or activity completed. I have often been on the phone with someone when it became immediately obvious that I didn't have her full attention, rather I was in direct competition with her children. Rather than continue and engage in unproductive conversation, I would usually ask for a better time to call back when we will be able to have a good one-to-one talk. To successfully complete any activity, you have to focus. The greater psychologist and philosopher, William James, wants to find focus as possession of the mind in clear, 
visual form of one of what seems several simultaneous possible objectives or trains of thought. It is locking in on what's important. It implies withdrawal from some things in order to deal effectively with others. A simpler way of defining it is in terms of the mental energy required to gather significant details and tune out unnecessary distractions. Focus applies three things: concentration, giving yourself to what you're doing and being intensely involved in your job, an idea, your community, or your family. When you focus your camera, you bring images together to form a sharp, clear picture. When you focus on strategic planning, you do much of the same thing. You define and clarify your problems, your mission, and your goals. You produce sharp, clear pictures, and then things begin to fall into place that previously seemed to defy solution. When you finally choose a focus and concentrate on a goal, you begin to use more fully your past experiences, resources, and talents. Keep in mind, focus has two parts: focus and concentration. Focus is more long-term, like focusing on a career or a big goal. Concentration is more short-term, such as concentrating on getting something done right now. Both focus and concentration mean zeroing in on one thing and blocking out everything else. You need to both focus and concentrate on your road to success. Keep your goals focused uppermost in your mind, and snap into your concentration mode when you're finishing and finalizing a project or a report, learning a new application, working on a court case, writing a letter, doing a term paper, or just winning a game. Ten keys to create focus in your life. So, how do you know if you have a problem focusing? If you have tasks or projects that you've not finished or lost interest in, or simply did not follow through on, you have a lack of focus. A repetition of these experiences can often make you feel like a failure, because you just don't seem to be able to accomplish anything meaningful. However, this is not the truth. If you learn to focus properly, you have the ability to become successful at anything you do. It's a skill you can learn. Action steps, narrow focus, means taking one thing at a time. Once you're clear on your big picture and assess the challenges, possibilities, and threats, it's time to narrow down your focus on the steps you need to take to bring your vision slash dream slash goal slash project to fruition. Take one step at a time and only focus on what needs to be done. So it's crucial that you have a clear and detailed plan of action. However, you can have the best vision and plan, but without taking actual action, nothing will come to fruition. This is the reason why I call narrow focus action steps focus, because you need to take action and execute every step of your plan. What you need to focus on, you create in your life. So it's critical that you focus on things that are worthwhile and will improve your life. The ten keys to creating focus in your life are the following: one, your commitment to your vision and the process, the action steps, are essential to create the necessary focus and motivation to keep you going. Two, set achievable, measurable, and realistic goals/slash steps. As you achieve your action steps, it will inspire you to move towards the next step. Three, stay focused on the positive and pay attention to the benefits and gains you achieve along the way with each action step. Four, keep improving your focus by working at it every day. Five, without enthusiasm, you might not find the journey interesting enough to continue. When you first set your goal or vision, enthusiasm gives you the zest or oomph to tackle things head-on. As time progresses, it's natural to lose some of the oomph. However, if you learn to keep yourself enthused and recommit regularly to your goal or vision, you will be adding fuel to carry on.
Positive self-talk also helps you to stay in the oomph mode. So, get excited about what you're doing and working towards. Six, the saying "Your attitude determines your altitude" means that with a positive attitude, nothing will ever seem hopeless or a waste of time or even too big a challenge. If you do encounter a setback, you will get right back up and move on. Seven, focus takes tremendous self-discipline. You have to be strong enough to stick to your plan, track your progress, be objective to change it if necessary, and execute it daily. You have to be dedicated to avoid temptations and self-doubt, negative thoughts, but still be flexible if the unexpected happens. Eight. Avoid procrastination. Procrastination is like a thief stealing your results. If you tend to overthink things before doing, stop. You're doing yourself no favors, and you will set yourself up for failure. Nine, be consistent. Consistency is absolutely crucial to your focus. Spending thirty minutes or an hour per day on your action steps brings your vision closer every day. Thirty minutes or an hour every day seems insignificant, but in a five-day period, equates to 150 minutes or five hours spent focused towards your vision. Example: It's like exercising for 20 minutes a day or brushing your teeth for three minutes per day. Done consistently every day calculates to 140 minutes of exercise in a week and 21 minutes brushing your teeth. If you do it daily, it's not much of an effort, and you will get the benefit of improving your fitness level every day and having fresh breath. However, if you exercise once a week for 140 minutes or brush your teeth only once a week for 21 minutes, you'll certainly not get fit, and your teeth will be full of plaque, and your breath will not smell great. Ten, tenacity is perfectly explained in the saying. Quitters never win, and winners never quit. Creating and keeping a strong focus is hard work, but is a skill that will serve you for the rest of your life. Believe in yourself and your ability to succeed at whatever you do. Therefore, it is extremely important what you decide to focus on and work towards. So, if your vision, dream. Goal or project is very important to you, and you keep the ten keys to create focus in your mind. You will achieve success. Your brain and its relationship to the world around us is set up in such a way that how you focus your mind and energy determines the results you achieve. We need to focus our attention on the things we desire to achieve and maintain that focus. The better we can focus on the correct things, the more we will achieve. In order to focus, we need to condition our mind and manage our time. Stretch your comfort zone. I think we can agree that stretching is an important component of any effective exercise program, right? Well, it's my belief that stretching is equally as important in an effective personal development program. The kind of stretching I'm talking about is the beyond your comfort zone kind of stretching. Back in my health club days, I would tell my clients to get beyond the pain. Now, this was in no way a suggestion to work through an injury. It was a means to motivate and inspire in order to get them through the discomfort and reap the benefit of all their hard work. As much as they hated it in the moment, when they finally got through it, they always felt stronger and more powerful. Those are the benefits of stretching yourself beyond your comfort zone. When you think about it, haven't you consistently experienced personal growth when you faced an uncomfortable experience and worked your way through it? There's nothing wrong with having a comfort zone, but if you want to reach a higher level, you have to stretch your comfort zone to success. I personally think comfort zones are the succubi of life that lead to ruts, not performance excellence. Here's the paradox: most of us strive to get our lifestyles comfortable, and then eventually 
and inevitably, we connect with our own deeper truth and begin searching for a broader comfort zone that offers some degree of challenge, growth, and opportunity for meaningful service and purpose in life, for a deeper connection with life and our work. Thomas More's Care of the Soul and a Life at Work It's not that we describe ourselves as unhappy, but there's a chronically reoccurring and uneasy feeling that we've yet to hit our full potential. Comfort zones feel safe, and the illusion is we buy into being in control while taking up residence. Life appears, in our comfort zone, relatively familiar, stable, secure, and contradictory to an environment of growth. I'll share an example of one of my clients. I'll call her Rockstar, because she is. Rockstar has been having control issues related to some challenges her daughter has been experiencing at school. Rockstar likes to be in control, and the fact she had no control over the situation was causing a lot of frustration and blocked energy from her. Rockstar began to implement some of the tools we've been working with, like affirmations, gratitude journaling, and using I choose statements when practicing positive self-talk. Recently, Rockstar started to notice something. She shared with me that even though it was difficult for her to stay in a place of discomfort about her daughter's challenges at school, she was doing it anyway. Please understand the full scope of this. Rockstar feels out of control. She wants more than anything to be able to find the solutions to her child's challenges, yet she can't. So, she's decided to sit in this place of discomfort and lack of control and just be with it and find peace in this place. Do you get how much courage this takes? As a result of this, she's learning how to better manage her own emotional energy and in turn, is actually serving her daughter better by being the mother and advocate she needs to be. Just the other day, Rockstar made a conscious decision to choose peace and inner contentment over anger and frustration as it relates to her daughter's situation. Do you know how that happened? Let's take a look. Rockstar got very courageous and chose to stretch herself beyond her comfort zone. Rockstar survived that experience. Rockstar gained confidence, strength, and inner wisdom from this experience. Through this new awareness of her potential, Rockstar figured out that she's powerful beyond her imagination. Rockstar wound up being exactly what her daughter needed her to be. Change your habits and expand your comfort zone. The self-improvement business was built on doing stretching exercises for our brain. We need to prepare ourselves to be better and to accomplish change that will enhance our lives. We train our bodies and our minds to do more. It's human nature. You will note that I've been writing in the present tense as if you're all doing this. Many of us don't prepare our bodies and minds so we can grow and improve ourselves we slide into taking the path of least resistance. It's our comfort zone. It's mindless. We don't have to make any decisions. We're trapped. The door's not locked, but we don't venture out. It's my opinion that being stuck in your comfort zone is what could be holding you back from all kinds of things in life. A better career. A better relationship with friends and co-workers. The opportunity to travel. You could become a volunteer and give some of your untapped talents to those in need. The reality is that many people just come home at the end of the day and say, I'm exhausted, I deserve a beer and a night on the couch. I personally feel the most important factor of all is to create a sense of opportunity and exploring for our children. Our children are, after all, just little us. I was once having a conversation with a friend, and she said, my god, our children are doing better than we are. Well, isn't that the plan? I ask, did this happen because of you, or in spite of you? I say fantastic for the soccer mums and dads. 
just don't flop in front of the tube when you get home. Stay engaged with your children, but be careful. You might have some fun. Could you imagine looking down from the pearly gates and reading your own obituary? It reads, Bob was a loving father and husband who spent many years in front of the television watching his favourite shows that brought him so much joy. If this is making you feel a little uncomfortable, you need to ask yourself the question, My God, is that me? Many of us today ask, what's in it for me? It's a time when people want instant answers. I believe that one of the reasons that blogging is so successful is that people want instant answers. They don't want to read a whole book. Just let me read something short and sweet that will fix what needs to be fixed right now. Why on earth do you think infomercials are everywhere on TV? It's a water full of money that comes from people trapped in their comfort zones. Claims like, create a new you in 30 days. Make a fortune in just 60 days. You can do this. I just love this claim. We've done all the hard work to make it easy for you. Yeah, there are lots of success stories on each of these shows to support the claims, What they don't tell you is that over 90% of the programs purchased from infomercials are gathering dust in a matter of weeks. There's an audience of millions of people out there knowing how their living needs to change. Hold it now. That means I have to change my habits? Changing how we live can be easy if we do it in small steps. Habit changing can be fun if you approach it with the right attitude. Don't try to change too many things at once. See things through. Build on your small but important victories. Success and happiness will birth from loving what you do for a living and how you interact with your family and community. Changing your habits to be the best person you can be doesn't cost a dime. Imagine that. One of my favourite books is Dr. Seuss' Oh, The Places You'll Go. A must-have for every adult over 35 years of age. This book is suggestive of leaving one's comfort zone, albeit from a child's perspective. Its pearls of wisdom and encouragement come from stretching ourselves and continuously, consciously embracing change. When I awoke in my life versus running on automatic pilot somewhere in my mid to late 30s, I began happily to experiment with the risk of rejection, failure, disappointment, criticism, being ignored, looking foolish, and trying new things. To this day, I remain committed to the process of developing the courage to rise above the ordinary. What would be my advice for those just stepping out of their comfort zones? Here it is, my three quick tips on how to comfortably, safely, and joyously leave, expand, and stretch your comfort zone. Get a small and quick win up front. I often suggest taking a small and highly doable project and complete it within the next day or two. Go declutter some room, closet, or drawer at home. Not only do you build confidence in accomplishing this quick and relatively easy goal so that you can go on to a bigger one, I can guarantee clearing some space will allow for something new to come in. Get your hair cut, trimmed, or just part it on a different side. Buy a blouse or shirt in a new, bright colour or pattern that you don't usually wear. Point is this. Do one thing different on the outside that's going to make you feel new and exciting, if not a tad uncomfortable on the inside. Change or transformation can begin in either direction. Why not pick something on you to begin to change now? Get support or the appropriate resources to motivate and inspire you to move forward. Attend a workshop, lecture, read a book. See a movie, take a person who already left their comfort zone to lunch, or hire a coach is to help you sharpen your vision and develop confidence that will catapult you to the next, higher threshold of your life or business. Start taking action. Do you know what keeps people from achieving their goals or living their dreams? It's not taking action. 
you can spend all the time in the world envisioning your future, setting goals, creating affirmation statements, meditating, and networking with successful people. However, if you spend all your time preparing and don't take any action, your goals won't materialize. Yes, you have to start taking action to make your goals and dreams come true. Most people come up with brilliant ideas and want to make improvements to their financial well-being, health, and relationships with family and friends. However, self-doubt can step in when you start thinking, "I can't," or "It's impossible to do," before they even start taking action. Too many dreams have been shattered, especially those with lots of potential, because people don't take action before self-doubt starts to kick in. We can do everything at once, but we can do something at once. Calvin Coolidge, you must take action now in moving forwards towards your goals or the outcomes in your life that you wish to achieve. Psychologists have done a lot of research and have found many people are waiting until tomorrow or until something happens to them to start working on their goals. Many people unconsciously think someone will show up at your door, ring the bell, and then tell you, "Now you have permission to get started on working on your life and goals." That's not the way it works. This is only a fantasy in your head. You must do the work yourself, and you must get started now. People who are not working towards goals and achieving their dreams in life are wasting time. You could be the next Michael Jordan. Or Einstein, but unless you start working on your goals, you'll never achieve either. There's so much untapped potential, wisdom, ability, and talent in this world, and each and every one of us is really amazing when you think about it. It's also a shame when you think about how much potential each person has, and how little they do to develop and maximize that potential. You must make a plan now. And start taking action. You can either set goals or solve problems, and then results will be the same. You will achieve the outcome and desires you're looking for in life. You must grab the bull by the horns and start seizing each moment when it comes to you. Do not continue waiting around for something to happen. Something may happen to you one day. But it may be a long time from now, and you only have a limited amount of time on this planet. If you've set your goals, make sure to begin taking action right away while you have high energy and enthusiasm. Ride the wave of momentum before it dies out. Decide what you're going to do in the next 24 to 48 hours to put one of your main goals into action. If your goal is to lose 10 pounds by July of this year, then make the decision to spend 30 minutes a day walking, and just do it. Don't delay, and don't make up excuses that you don't have time. Then plan what you're going to do during the next 30 days to put some of your other goals into action. If you want to exceed your sale targets for the quarter, then make a plan of how many prospecting calls you're going to make every day for the next 30 days. Discipline yourself so that you follow through with your plan. Have faith and confidence in yourself that you're going to achieve big goals. Don't worry about what other people will think about you. It's your life, not theirs. And whatever you do, don't give up. Too many people give up right before the floodgates of success start opening. Go get the degree that you want now. Go find the person that you want to share your life with now. Go figure out who you are and what your unique ability is that you can contribute to this world now. Even if you end up making what we call a mistake or two along the way, this is a great thing. You should minimize, but welcome mistakes in life. It's what you do with these mistakes and how you correct the path you're on in life that matters. When you start taking action, you'll feel alive and start to get addicted to that feeling. Soon, you'll build up an unstoppable momentum that will drive you forward until you reach your destination.
it would be the equivalent to a snowball, starting at the top of Mount Everest and rolling down. When it gets 20% of the way down the hill, there's no stopping it. The momentum's so high, all you can do is get out of the way, or go with it. You need to become that snowball, rolling down Mount Everest. Success comes by taking action, and that means immediate action, daily action, weekly action, monthly action, and so forth. The importance of taking action cannot be stressed enough if you're to succeed in achieving your goals. Just as blood is necessary to keep you alive, action is just as necessary for success in achieving your goals. You can't sit and plan till it's perfect, because there will never be a perfect time and perfect plan in place. There's always unforeseen things that you will have to adjust to. Remember, you don't have to get it right, you have to get it going, and once you get it going, you can make the necessary adjustments. Even if you do something wrong, you've learned something from the action you took, you gain experience that will be valuable, again, to you in the future. Only by taking action can you learn what will work and what will not. Sure, someone can give you advice on what will work and what will not, but each situation's different, and sometimes what's worked for some may not work for others, and vice versa. While it is good to put together a plan of action, it's not good to spend too much time on it. Get the basics of what you'll need to get going, and then start working on the plan. When you're taking things into action, it will start to come together, and you'll see what else needs to be done, and you can then make them adjustments. No plan's going to work perfectly from beginning to end, so why should you bother trying to plan it perfectly from beginning to end? That's going to be a complete waste of time. You just have to get it going. Start with what you have and start taking action. You'll not dream your way to success, and you have to take some form of action each and every day, Even if the results are not what you expected, they're still better than not having any results at all from not taking action. While you may have fears and doubts, those same fears and doubts will soon disappear when you start taking action, because you'll be learning, and learning how to do something erases fear and doubts, and learning builds confidence. The quickest way to learn what works and what does not work is taking action, And when you take action, you start seeing the results from those actions and steps you took, from those action steps you took. If they are working, you keep doing what you're doing. If you're not seeing the results you want, then make corrections and try again. While a plan of action is important, it's even more important to take action each day. All the planning you do in the world will not get the job done. Only by taking action can you achieve what it is that you wish to achieve. Start taking action, and you'll be amazed at what you can do, and soon you'll start seeing the results of your hard work and the success you deserve. Live with passion. I remember that night like it was yesterday. It was one of those times in life when it just clicks, When you get it, when everything you've heard, studied, and read about for years suddenly become absolutely clear. I saw it, and I saw it clearly. The element I was missing that would make my life skyrocket was passion. The realization came when I saw one of my mentors giving a speech, and it became abundantly clear. He was, and still is, wildly successful, And the one thing that made him so was his absolute passion. Everything else, his skills, his personality, his ability to take massive action, etc., really all fell under the big umbrella of passion. In fact, from there, I looked at all my mentors, the people I admire most in this world, and they all had it, absolute passion. No matter what they did, they conveyed this passion. And they're completely magnetic people, because they ooze passion. Because they ooze passion. Immediately, I began to look at my own life, and so many things suddenly became abundantly clear. 
The way I spoke to anyone and everyone lacked passion. The way I presented myself to the world lacked passion. The way I went about conducting business lacked passion. Even my posture conveyed a lack of passion. This lack of passion had permeated each and every area of my life. This wasn't at all in line with the ideal self that I wanted to be. Hell, the more I looked, the more I could see that I was someone that even I didn't really want to be around. I knew it was time for a change. After all, the opposite of living with passion is really living in a way in which we're shielding ourselves in some way, and in some extreme cases, even hiding from the world. I certainly lived in the latter for many years, and this was the realization that allowed me to finally shed my old skin and to live each day, each moment, with absolute passion. From that moment on, when I spoke to people, any people, from my family and friends to people I'd just met, I did it with passion. When I conducted any business, I was able to take massive action and move ahead rather easily because I did it with passion. Any time I wanted to convey my point of view, I did it with passion. I would go through every day completely aware of my thinking and kept it in line with this passionate state. I made sure my actions were in line with this passion. And I'm not just talking the big stuff. I would have it on my mind constantly, even when doing menial tasks like grocery shopping. I did this until I'd replaced my old conditioning and had reprogrammed my subconscious mind. I did it until living with passion had become second nature, from the time I woke up until the time I went to sleep. I define passion as love fearlessly expressed, life fearlessly lived. I'm not talking about the fearlessness of bungee jumping or skydiving, although for many of you that may be part of it, but rather the fearlessness to fully embrace all of life, to lower walls of self-protection. Walls not only keep things out, they keep you in. To live for love, and love to live. It's someone who chooses to be fully engaged, and deeply involved, and totally dedicated to life itself. Passion requires you to open your heart. It demands to be expressed, not held in. We must act out passion before we can feel it, Jean-Paul Sartre tells us. Passion is the result of action. Life is about action and embracing its full width. Paradoxically, to bring more passion and joy into your life, you must be open to experiencing sadness, anxiety, and fear. Passion can hurt. Passion is the habit of living in the moment and learning to take all that you can from it. Sometimes that includes sorrow, so don't waste it. Use your sorrow to more greatly savor the good, to more greatly appreciate what you have, and to grow into a deeper person. Sorrow and hardship actually play a greater role in having a great big life than do victory and joy, because without sorrow, victory and joy are meaningless. Learning that joy can come from suffering in this life, for by it is produced great appreciation and character. Live the life you love by finding passion and changing your life. You may have heard people talking about doing the work they're passionate about. But if you've been in a career or a job that you don't really like for many years, you may not even be able to think about what you're passionate about. You must think back to your childhood to reach into this area of thinking. I'd always wanted to be a writer, but several people had told me that my writing was not good enough. I chose to believe them and didn't write for more than 20 years. Now I write every day because I'm passionate about it. Look at what you would do if money were not in the equation. Think about what your friends come to you and ask your help with. My friends used to ask me about which computer to buy and how to use certain software programs. I never saw this as anything special, 
until I realised I was passionate about helping them to use their computer to improve their lives in a variety of ways. When you have a day off, or even a few hours to yourself, allow your mind to wander and daydream. How would you be spending your time if it was completely up to you? What's most important in your life? What's on your bucket list? Once I understood that, my life was completely up to me. Everything changed. I moved to a new city, changed careers, and met many new people. I can honestly say now that I'm living my passion. You can do the same thing if you're willing to take a close look at your life and change the things you're doing each and every day. Remember that the reason to find your passion is to give you the time and money to live the life that you choose. Three tips for living the passionate life if those around you have no passion. Living your life with passion can become challenging if you're around people who do not share your beliefs. All attempts at maintaining a positive thinking and believing system may be stretched to the limits as you find yourself dealing with people who continue to see the glass as half empty. Here are three tips on dealing with these kinds of people. 1. Lead by example. Instead of telling your friends and family exactly what you're feeling or doing day by day, show them. You may be surprised at how observant people are, especially children. When they see you in a happy, relaxed state, they will begin to pick up that things are different. Instead of reacting to a situation, they will observe how you look for a positive outcome that will benefit everyone involved. 2. Set time aside for yourself daily. Insist on making time just for you each day. This should be uninterrupted time where you can think, write, breathe, stretch, and just daydream. Choose a time of the day that will work with your schedule and stick to it as though it were an appointment. You may need to begin with a short period of time and extend it as the people around you adjust to it. You'll find that your family members will respect this time and even remind each other that you're not to be disturbed for anything that is not an emergency during this time. 3. Invite those closest to you to become a part of your passion. Living a passionate life is largely about having the time and energy to enjoy every precious event with those you love. By sharing what you're feeling and how it relates to them, your family will begin to understand what your particular passion is all about. Allow them to see how happy you are when you're involved in your passion. They may never know who you are deep inside unless you invite them in to see. As you become more experienced in this area, your friends and family will feel more comfortable sharing their passions with you. In getting to know these people on a more intimate basis, you will all grow and expand. If these are issues from the past that are painful, you may find ways to work through them that will solidify the foundation of your friends and family's beliefs. Living your life with passion is not a solo experience. It's one that encompasses all of the people that you come into contact with on a regular basis. Our life is what happens to us each day as we're busy making great plans for the future. The passion is in the journey. Walk the path slowly so that you will learn and grow with each step. Invite the people close to you to join you at times that are appropriate for each of you. In this way, you can live the passionate life while showing others around you How to find their own passions. Changing your habits. The NLP techniques. NLP, or Neuro Linguistic Programming, is a way of understanding why you see life the way you do and why you make the decisions you make. It's a way of understanding the subtle interconnections taking place between the signals going to and from your brain, the messages coded into those messages, and how your personal experiences decode those messages that become the base of your thinking patterns and behaviours. 
NLP was developed in the early 1970s by Richard Bandler and John Grinder. Neuro refers to the way information is processed by the mind through the senses. Linguistic refers to the way we use language to communicate our experiences to ourselves and others. And programming describes how the brain codes experiences to create personal programs that determine our ways of being. And behaving in the world. In other words, NLP is a way to describe precisely how people perceive experiences, represent them to themselves, communicate them to others, and encode them within their brain. Understanding this process makes it possible to change an experience or replicate someone else's experience. How NLP is mostly used. Outside of a therapeutic setting, is in studying and replicating or modeling personal excellence. It's a tool that is widely used in business and personal development. NLP is extremely effective in changing subconscious programming, whether that's eliminating a belief and installing a new belief. Disrupting old, disempowering patterns or programs, and installing more empowering patterns or programs, turning on and off emotional states at will, and eliminating conflict within yourself. The downside with NLP is that it does require training in order for you to be truly effective in using many of the processes. And because much of what we say and do is out of conscious awareness, it can be more difficult to use NLP on yourself. For example, if you were to ask a highly successful business person how they succeeded, they probably couldn't give you a precise answer. They most likely don't even know. Consciously, what made the difference, and therefore are unable to articulate it. Similarly, we often aren't aware, at a conscious level, of how we sabotage ourselves. Only that we do. The key to success or failure then is often unknown at the conscious level. That's why an athlete can be sensational one time and fail the next. Even though their preparation was, on the surface, exactly the same, dig a little deeper. However, using NLP, and the differences start to emerge that explain the contrast in results. Eliciting these unknown pieces of the puzzle is sometimes referred to as the magic of NLP, although of course it's not magic at all. Once elicited, you can interrupt the sabotaging program that was running and change the end result. The brain processes information and stores our life experiences using our five senses. When we later remember those experiences, we do so using our five senses again. That is why, if you remember or imagine biting into a lemon, you see. Smell and taste the lemon, even though it's only happening in your mind. In NLP, these senses are called motor lights, and there are three main ones: visual, seeing; auditory, hearing; and kinesthetic, feeling. Our other two senses, olfactory, smell, and gustatory, taste, are a part of the kinesthetic modality. Most people have a preference for and operate primarily from one main sensory modality. Most people aren't so good at changing bad habits because they won't work at replacing them with habits that suit their purposes better. Equally, some people won't recognize that what they're doing hasn't become a bad habit. They choose instead to blame their environment, their upbringing, or to say things like "It's just the way I am." Most people don't have that willingness to break bad habits. They have a lot of excuses and talk like victims. Carlos Santana, two friends of mine who I shall call Roger and Elaine, have been married now for something like forty-five years. When he was a young man, Roger ran a youth soccer team, just as I did, and that's how we came to know each other. Changing bad habits, Roger and Elaine. I remember when they first started going out together. They were a good-looking young couple, slim, fit, and well balanced. They are still a lovely couple. The only difference is that they're enormous. 
When I visited their home recently and saw their wedding picture upon the wall, I had difficulty believing they were the same two people I'd known all these years. Although Roger manages to get out and about and leads a reasonably active life, despite his 280 to 300 pounds in weight, Elaine can't go very far at all and suffers bouts of ill health related solely to her size and weight. Some years ago, Convinced that their ever-increasing weight was due to some abnormal growth hormone or some other disease, they visited specialists, but to no avail. Changing bad habits, their bad habit. I don't believe that even now they recognise that everything is down to their own bad habit. It is a bad habit they appear to have adopted together once they were married. What is the bad habit? They eat too much. No doubt, at first, they ate a little more than they should, and gradually, as their stomachs have increased in size, they've eaten still more, and so the cycle's gone on. Changing bad habits. Some habits serve us. So, often our habits serve us well. Do you remember learning to tie your shoelaces, for example? It was a struggle at first, wasn't it? It gradually became easier and easier. I suspect that when you now tie your shoelaces, you don't even think about it most of the time, and often it's done in a rush. That simple task, just like driving a motor vehicle or brushing your teeth, has become such a habit that you don't have to consider it. This is how our brains make things easy for us. But now and again, we get into bad habits. We eat too much, we drink too much alcohol, we smoke and don't know how to stop. All these are habits. We start them because in some way they make us comfortable. For that very reason, the brain keeps urging us to repeat them. Why willpower doesn't work? We are what we repeatedly do. Aristotle. There was a time in my life where I was running about six miles a day, nearly every day. I didn't become that annoying person overnight. The first time I went out on a run, it was on a track at a community college near my childhood house. The loop was one quarter mile, so I had to run around it four times to complete a mile. The first time I went out, I couldn't run around the loop once without stopping. I only ran slash walked a mile that day. Then the next day, I woke up and ran slash walked another mile. I slowly progressed, but before I realised it, I could run a mile without stopping. And eventually, I could easily run six. I was in college at the time, and my friends watched me transform into this person, a person who regularly sought out a runner's high, a runner. And because of this habit that I built, people would love to tell me how motivated I was, and how I clearly had much more willpower than they had. I didn't argue, but I also didn't realise they were wrong. It wasn't willpower or motivation. I simply built a habit. The habit became so ingrained that I created a new identity surrounding it. Willpower relies on motivation and decision-making. It is a finite resource that requires you to use your mental faculties to either convince yourself to do something or talk yourself out of doing something. It's exhausting. And when it inevitably doesn't work, you blame yourself. Decision-making, like willpower, and automatic behaviours, like habits, happen in two different parts of the brain. Neuroscientists have discovered that the part of the brain where decision-making happens is prefrontal cortex, the basal ganglia, a part of the brain responsible for forming habits. The basal ganglia also plays a key role in the development of pattern recognition, memories and emotions. Once a behaviour becomes automatic and habitual, the decision-making part of your brain isn't really involved anymore. It effectively checks out, and you go on autopilot. Here's why this is an incredible advantage. We can form habits that require complex behaviour, while only using minimal brain activity. 
In other words, our brains already possess the mechanisms that allow us to stop relying on willpower and default to habits. The habit loop. Understand what's driving you. According to researchers at Duke University, habits account for about 45% of our behaviors on any given day. That's almost half of our behaviors that are unconscious and habitual. Simply accepting whatever habits we've formed is one option. Alternatively, we can try to deconstruct and potentially construct habits by understanding how they're formed and how they work. Every habit has three parts, the cue, the behavior, and the reward. The habit loop. Cues can vary. Cues can be any of the following, time, day, a location, emotional state, an event, or people. I'm sure you have habits that are triggered by all of these cues. Whether you're conscious of it or not, you most likely have some sort of routine when you first wake up, time. You probably have certain habits that you do through Monday. You probably have certain habits that you do Monday through Friday that differs from your weekend habit, day. When you go into work, you probably have a routine before you start working, location. Social media and eating crappy food could be bad habits you default into when you're in a particular emotional state, like boredom. And your cell phone buzzing, an event, probably always gets you to pick it up and pay attention to it. Even with all the studies done by neurologists and psychologists, the big caveat still remains. Every person and every habit are different. So each habit and each person may require a different approach to make a new habit or break an old one. Using NLP and self-hypnosis for habit change. Have you ever wanted to change a habit, yet just seemed unable to break the pattern? Well, just about everyone has, so you're not alone, nor are you simply too weak-willed. There are innumerable reasons why changing a habit can seem so difficult. Stress response, anchored situations, and stimulus are just three possible stumbling blocks to successful habit change. I want to teach you a simple way to help you finally break the pattern of old, redundant habits. The first thing to do is make a decision. Do you really want to change the habit, or are you holding on to it at an unconscious level? What could be the possible gain of keeping the habit? Is it like an old friend, so familiar you're kind of comfortable with it in some way? If it really doesn't hurt you or anyone else, you may choose to keep it. You may choose to get comfortable with it and assign it to harmless idiosyncrasy. Or you may decide that you're really fed up with it and want to be free to make more choices about your behavior. In many cases, it's not the habit itself that is annoying, but the feeling that we have no choice. The first step to change is really deciding that you want to change. When you're really certain you want to change, then change is just a matter of time and a little NLP hypnotic brain rewiring. Ask yourself these questions. Do I really want to change this habit or modify it? What need does this habit meet? What other behavior would meet that need? What resources do I already have to make the change? What internal or external resources will I need to discover? What might changing this habit mean to me and everything else in my life, both positively and negatively? When you've answered those questions to your utter satisfaction, you can begin to build new habits and behaviors using the tools of NLP and hypnosis. Having decided you really want change, you have taken the essential step towards it. What attitude and behavior would you like instead of the old habit? It's not enough just to not want the habit. You need to develop a new positive way of behaving that meets all the needs of the new habit. Would the ability to simply relax and smile at the old behavior be a good thing? Would the ability to notice its pull and be able to laugh and dismiss it be good as well? 
I will assume it as a good outcome to find yourself disinterested and bored by the old habit so that you eventually forget about it completely. This is the part where change occurs. Find somewhere where you can safely relax. Close your eyes and focus on the flow of your breathing, letting thoughts come and go, but remaining focused on your breath as you gently scan down your body, relaxing all your muscles from your head to your toes. While you're very relaxed and comfortable, you're going to use your memory and imagination to change your habit. Make a living picture in your mind of all the negative things you feel about this habit, its unattractiveness, its unnecessary risks, its silliness, and its waste of time and money, and all the times of acute embarrassment you might have felt about it. Make the picture slash feeling as strong and as uncomfortable as possible. Now say something to yourself like, no more, enough, never again. Some expression that lets you know with certainty that you're about to change that old redundant habit for a better way of behaving, not because you feel guilty in some way, but because you want the freedom to choose. You choose to be free. Relax inside with your focus on your breath and begin to build a better picture within your mind. How you want to be how you want to behave, and all the associated feelings of freedom and achievement you feel by being free of that old limiting behavior. Begin to smile inside and out as you push the old picture and habit away while you step inside the new picture of your freedom with all its associated good feelings. Really live it through your own eyes and ears. Experience the freedom fully and with pleasure allowing yourself the chance to step into freedom. Set a word, a picture, or a physical feeling to the picture slash idea and use its power whenever that old pattern shows up. Keep practicing this simple skill and soon you'll be completely free of that old habit. Use the NLP swish pattern to break bad habits. Many of us have bad habits, and we may not be able to stop ourselves from doing these. It's a good thing to know, in today's modern generation, there are modern ways how to break them. One of these is the NLP coaching. There are many NLP techniques, which the practitioner may use, depending on your situation, preferences, as well as needs. However, one of the techniques which is proven effective to break bad habits is the swish pattern. Before that, what are some of the bad techniques which you want to break? This can be fingernail biting, smoking, drinking alcohol, eating unhealthy foods, and so much more. How does the swish pattern work? Swish pattern is the process of responding accordingly to circumstances that you usually cannot perform well. When you get to master this technique, you will no longer need your conscious mind to react to certain situations, including those negative ones. This is because your response will be controlled by your subconscious mind. Like, for instance, when you're in a situation that leads you to fail because you think of your past failures, mistakes, and frustrations, swish pattern will change these beliefs of you. You will picture out a more positive outlook of your life, which will make you more successful. Remember, whenever you desire to break a habit, it's very important to substitute a more desirable habit in its place. Trying to break a bad habit without substituting some desirable alternative in its place leaves a void, and the unconscious may try to fill the void by bringing back the old habit or another unwanted behavior in its place. The swish pattern has several different variations. Here are two simple ways of executing it. Method 1. Start out by visualizing yourself, performing the habit or behavior you want to break. You may also want to include a specific trigger that may occur before you break into this bad habit in your mental image. 2. Now visualize yourself, performing a substitute habit that is positive and productive, something that you can easily slip in as an alternative to the bad habit. 3. 
keep the two images separated from one another, either side by side in your mind, or you can have one picture behind the other. Four, envision the image of yourself engaged in the good substitute habit, and have this picture quickly fly into the image of you doing the unwanted habit. See the unwanted image actually smash into and through the bad habit image. Imagine the bad habit image shattering into a thousand pieces, like shards of glass. It can actually be very effective to make a sound out loud, a swoosh or swish sound, each time you envision the two steps colliding and crashing, and see the good habit image now replace the bad image. It's a good idea to repeat this process at least once a day or more. At first, until the good habit begins to become ingrained, and you're no longer unconsciously performing the bad habit, but are now always aware that you have a choice. Method two, another even simpler swish variation for breaking bad habits goes like this: start out visualizing performing the habit or behavior you want to break. Again, you can add in the trigger that occurs just before you perform your unwanted habit. Then visualize yourself performing your substitute habit that is a good, productive replacement. Now, see yourself pushing the image of the bad habit away while you perform the replacement habit. Imagine an image of yourself in a very positive state. You imagine starting to perform the unwanted habit, see yourself stopping the behavior, and snap your fingers. The last step is to visualize yourself in the positive state, doing something that affirms you have broken the bad habit, such as performing your substitute habit instead. Practice this a number of times until you automatically do this sequence before performing the old habit. And you should begin to find yourself choosing to perform the replacement habit now, instead of the old habit, and feeling really good about yourself as you execute the new habit. How I overcame a 30-year habit in literally five minutes. Andy Ray, I've been biting my fingernails for literally well over 30 years. I started as a boy of around seven or eight, and it's continued up until just a couple of months ago. In this short article, I will tell you exactly how I did it, so you can use it on any particular bad habits you have. It won't cost you anything. I offer this information free of charge. There's no sales build-up either. This technique that I'll teach you in a minute is really easy to do. Okay, so let's get started. First, though, some background. About 20 years ago, I took neuro-linguistic programming (NLP). Training, thinking it would be the answer to helping me evolve as a human being. While the sensory acuity I developed was and is useful, not to mention the fundamental principles to change as well, I was very disappointed with it. I thought to myself, it just doesn't work on some people, I guess, and I must be one of those people. I was wrong, dead wrong. NLP interventions can work on anyone. Any human being, provided it's done correctly. All right, here are the steps to what's called the swish pattern intervention. Step one: isolate and identify the physical trigger. That sounds difficult to understand, so let me explain with a real-world experience. When I analysed when I'd bite my nails, I realised it was almost always when I was anxious or nervous. It had become so automatic. I literally didn't even notice it. Oftentimes, in the past, I had tried the swish pattern, but to limited success. I realized that I was not using the right trigger. Identifying the right trigger is vital. Now, realizing when I was nervous or anxious—two different emotions within the context of this article—when I bit my fingernails was a good first step, but it was not the most important thing. Identifying the specific cue was and is the most important first step. In fact, the emotions tied to the cue are essentially irrelevant. For me, the cue was putting my finger or my thumb in my mouth. How you're seeing the cue picture in your mind is critical too. It needs to be what's called associated or associative. What does that mean? 
Filmmakers call it POV, or point of view. It means you're seeing things out of your own eyes. Dissociated or disassociated means you're looking at yourself. For example, follow along with me for a minute, and this should become clear. Close your eyes and imagine you see yourself on a beautiful, sun-drenched beach with waves gently lapping at your feet. Watch yourself watch the dolphins playing in the surf, not too far off the beach. Okay, done. Watching yourself—that's disassociated. If you go back and visualize that particular scene, but this time watching the dolphins out of your own eyes and feeling the waves gently lap at your feet—that is associated. Those are called submodalites, and are the ingredients or building blocks of human experience. We have modalites that are called auditory, hearing, gustatory, taste, visual, seeing, kinesthetic, feelings, and olfactory, smelling. Each visual or auditory experience has certain unique elements that make up that experience. Through manipulating those submodalities, you can reshape the experience. Okay, so that's step one. Identify the specific cue. Now, step two. Step two: identifying your images for the pattern. This step is important too. You've now identified your cue image. Now you want to choose an image of yourself that's disassociated. This is a very important distinction. This image must be a view that is realistic. It must be in a vacuum with no background scenery or landscape. This is usually easy to visualize for most people, as it's natural. Imagine a background that's black or grey, but make sure it's devoid of anything else other than yourself. Now, the image of yourself must be one of you that is the you you'd like to be, one who is actualizing, growing, evolving. It needs to be realistic. Don't imagine yourself standing next to a Ferrari and a handsome Brad Pitt-like boyfriend next to you, or an alluring starlet happily holding onto your arm. It has to be an image that your subconscious sees as realistic. For my nail-biting problem, I simply envisioned myself wearing clothes that I know I look good in. I saw myself neatly coiffed and smiling. I imbued my image as one of a person who has good habits and self-control, with clean and nicely grown cuticles. That's it. I didn't envision myself standing next to my new Aston Martin Vanquish with Jennifer Aniston on my arm and hundred-dollar bills falling out of my pockets. That's an image for another day. I simply visualized myself with realistic qualities my subconscious would synthesize as reasonable. Step three. Performing the swish pattern. Okay, we're almost there. What you want to do now is take that cue image, as discussed in step one, and visualize being in your body, initializing the cue. Then, in the lower right-hand corner of the image, see that idealized image of yourself without your habit. Then, very, very quickly, have the image formulated in step two, an idealized image of yourself. Growing big and bright in an instant, and the cue image from step one shrinking into nothingness. Do this ten times. It actually may feel a little peculiar to do this, but don't worry; it's perfectly harmless. Now test it out. Consciously try to start the cue. It should feel different. I knew mine had worked when a couple of minutes later, my hand unconsciously came up to my mouth and stopped on its own. I knew I'd made progress. The secret sauce. In the past, when I tried the swish pattern, it didn't work for a few days. I thought it was ineffective, as it didn't work the first time I did it. That was a huge error. Why? Because getting the cue image right is vital to the process. In fact, there may be multiple cues that you need to do this swish pattern with before it takes hold. You may also have to do this swish pattern constantly for a few weeks or longer in order to completely extirpate this habit out of existence. Before I give you the secret sauce, Tony Robbins shared a story once that I thought especially relevant to this process. 
He said that when he bought a piano tuner into his home, the piano tuner didn't just come once and then tune the piano, get paid and leave. He had to come back multiple times in order to solidify the tuning. When I heard that story, it struck a chord. No pun intended. I realized the Swedish pattern might not have worked with me, as I had not allowed it to take hold a bit. Plus, I realized my attitude was it had to work right and perfectly the first time, or it had to be classified as a failure. That's the secret sauce. Do the pattern daily, or even when you find yourself flirting with habit or cue image. It only literally takes a couple of minutes to do, and that's a very small price to pay to become a more evolved human being, don't you think? Seven NLP ways to train your brain in positive ways. One of the things NLP does is to show you how your mind creates the neural roots by which you behave in your daily life. My next metaphor exemplifying this is a groove created by the water. It rains. The water goes down a certain way. It rains again. The water goes down the same path. After many times, the rain created a groove, a ditch, and now it will always go down that path. This is exactly what's happening in your brain. But as the ditch can be changed, filled up with dirt or cement, so can your neural paths in your brain. In fact, your brain is changing all the time. The big name for it is neuroplasticity of the brain. But here are some ways to train your mind differently, and it's all in your power to do it now. No, I'm not talking about affirmations. These can work, but it will take anywhere between three to six months or more to achieve the desired result. Results may also vary depending on your ability to focus on the affirmation. Or you can try this, and it can go away immediately. Number one, make sure you know exactly what the behavior, the habit, is that you want to change. I'm fond of using the expression "you need to want to and not want to want to." Sometimes people say they want to change something because they get the feedback from others that they have a bad habit, so their motivational is external. Deep down, they don't really care. This makes a gigantic difference. If you're congruent consciously and unconsciously that you want to change something, and there is no part of you that is resistant to that change, you're ready to go. Two, to get there. You must know what the old habit is providing you with. In NLP, we call this secondary gain. What is it giving you? What's its purpose? For example, when people are addicted to certain foods, they replace something lacking in their life with that food, i.e., comfort, sweetness in life, pleasure, love, or even safety. This is best done by keeping a list of what you were thinking and feeling. Just before you ate that food, this will bring into consciousness the unconscious behavior. Three, notice the mental image. This is simple to do, but you must be precise. Here's the question to ask yourself: As I think of how much I like this food, do I have a picture in my mind? By the way, everyone has a picture in their mind. Close your eyes if you need to. This is very important. Notice where that picture is. Is it far away? Close? Up on your imaginary inner screen? Low on the screen? In the middle? Four. Change the mental image. Now, take that imaginary picture and move it far away, twenty-five feet, ten meters away. Make it really small, like a postage stamp. Make it black and leave it there. Stick it there with super glue. Five. Focus on something else you would like to do instead of the old habit. Imagine something else you like a lot, something healthy and positive for you. What's the picture of that? Notice it. Then make it so you like it a lot. Bring it close to you. Make it in beautiful colors, and notice how good that feels. Six. Think of what you will do instead in the future. Imagine in the future, one month from now, six months from now, one year from now, five years from now, what you will do. Instead of your bad habit, and here, folks, again, you must be specific. Everything will be all right. Is not good enough. 
The Seven Habits of Highly Effective NLP Practice. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective NLP Practice was written in honor of Stephen Covey and the beautiful legacy he left in his teachings. So many students, after taking an NLP course, want to be as effective as their trainers, or even more so. That wow! This can easily be created by practice and setting a well-formed outcome to do so. Habit one: be proactive. It's up to you to take the initiative. Decide to practice little chunks of NLP every day. Make the decision now, and you will soon notice that you can easily become top of your NLP game. No one will do it for you, so you have to decide to start today. Habit two: begin with the end in mind. Set a well-formed outcome to become an NLP virtuoso. An NLP virtuoso. Just sit down, write the answers on a piece of paper, frame it. What is it that you would like to get out of life by being a stellar whiz at NLP? How does this align with who you are, your goals, and your values? Do you have a mission and vision? Future pace yourself to that moment in time, already having reached it. What would happen if you did reach it? Act as if, starting today, you're an amazing, accomplished NLP practitioner magician. It's important that you reach your goal. Wouldn't you agree? Habit three: Put first things first. Start planning what you're going to do each day to practice NLP today. Divide NLP in little chunks, a chunk for each day. For instance, by spending five minutes a day practicing a language pattern. Set yourself a task every day: how to practice on someone else, anything from eliciting a positive state to paying attention to eye accessing, or noticing, or matching predicates, etc. If you're not actively doing any patterns with people, go out and find them. Schedule one a week is better than none each week, and realize this is not about urgency. This is about priority. It's about your priority to reach your well-formed outcome. How can you align your day to take action now? How can you align your day to take action now? Habit four: Think win-win. Spend some time considering how you reaching your well-formed outcome benefits your relationships of the people you love at work, the people you encounter on a daily basis. How does you becoming the Grand Master of NLP impact the world? How does it make you a better partner or a better mum slash dad? How can others help you become a better NLP practitioner? They have everything to gain if you do. What is it specifically that they gain? Habit five: Seek first to understand, then be understood. It's important in practicing. Using and applying techniques on others, that deep rapport is created, not superficial rapport, where you match and mirror, where you assume you are all that and a bag of chips, but where the match and mirror is truly created, because you have interest in understanding others. You want to be able to step into the second perceptual position of NLP, especially of those you care about. Have an open mind doing so. What makes someone else really tick? How do you look at yourself through the eyes of someone else? Do this first, and then use NLP involving others. It will not only make you a more effective NLP practitioner; it makes you a kinder human being. If you have a deep rapport, your work becomes more powerful than you can imagine. Where you operate from a place of caring, respect, and problem solving. Listen. I mean, really listen. Habit six: synergize. Combining strengths to practice NLP is a great idea. Gather a group of NLP practitioners to talk NLP, preferably in real life. Otherwise, on the internet, get a small group of coaching clients to create a synergy that is mutually beneficial. Are there any models of accomplished NLP practitioners around you? You may want to spend some time with this person and model him or her, or is there some close to you, maybe not someone in the world of NLP, who truly displays mastery in communication 
or another quality you admire. Habit seven: sharpen the saw. Put your mind, emotions, and your body in that spot for you to become the most powerful NLP practitioner. It's interesting to consider the NLP pie, and how many NLP practitioners are well versed in just mind and emotion, if that even. The body part of NLP goes no further than creating rapport, notice state shifts, or reading some eye accessing. If you want to be that NLP model of excellence, if you have mastery over your mind and emotion, doesn't that require a healthy body? Would you be a better NLP practitioner if your body was energized, balanced, and healthy? Would others respond differently to you? At the very least, your own mind and emotion would benefit from a healthy, balanced body full of energy. What body does a congruent leader have? Your mind is incredibly powerful, but very few know how to use it to maximum advantage. Using a simple tool like the swish pattern gives you more control in its management. In a very literal way, our mind, more specifically the things we think and how we think of them, determines our actions, feelings, and habits. Use this simple mind tool to help you become a more evolved person. I have. And will continue to do so. Bonus: Ten millionaire habits you can start implementing immediately. These are timeless habits that all millionaires have, so that they can have more, do more, share more, and to be masters of their own destiny. While there are a lot more than ten habits that they need to have before becoming successful millionaires, here are the top ten. Habit number one: Goals. Goals give you a clear sense of direction and a blueprint for the future. This is where you take the dreams out of your head and put them down onto paper. This is where you plan to arrive at a well-designed future destination, rather than at an undesigned future destination. Goals must be clear, precise, and action-oriented. A crucial part of goal setting is to ask yourself why. For example, why do you want that house? Why do you want that car? Why do you want that position in the company? Why do you want that salary? Once you ask enough whys, the hows get easier. Habit number two: passion. Whatever you work at, be passionate about it. This is a fundamental secret for financial success. What do you really love doing, and what do you have a natural talent for? What are your hobbies and interests? Once you have these answers, throw your heart and soul into doing it the best you possibly can. All millionaires love the work they do. Habit number three: excellence. Commit yourself to excellence in everything that you do. Set a goal today. To be in the top one percent of your professional field, excellence can be obtained if you care more than others think is wise, risk more than others think is safe, dream more than others think is practical, expect more than others think is possible. Habit number four: education. Dedicate yourself to lifelong education. Learn as much as you possibly can about your business. Learn the latest news and trends. Remember, the market pays excellent rewards for having excellent knowledge. Learning is the beginning of wealth. Learning is the beginning of health. Learning is the beginning of spirituality. Searching and learning is where the miracle process all begins. Jim Ron. Habit number five: Customer service. Dedicate yourself to always give excellent customer service, as the rewards are in direct proportion to the service that you give to people. Ask yourself these questions: What do my customers want? What do my customers need? What do my customers value? What service can I give my customers better than everyone else? What are my customers buying from others today? And what do I need to do to get them to buy from me? Habit number six: Don't believe in failure. 
Be prepared for the ups and downs along the way. Millionaires don't believe in failure. They just think of it as not the desired result yet, and that a different plan or strategy is needed. Habit number seven: imagination. Use your imagination. You have more creative ability than you think. We are at a moment in time when everything is automated for us. Start using a journal and start writing down all of your ideas, notes, and to-do lists that you have during your day. Remember to always think on paper. You never know when you could have that eureka moment that could be lost forever to memory if you do not commit it to paper. Guess what? Millionaires do not spend most of their free time watching soap operas and reality TV shows. Limit the amount of TV shows you watch to a bare minimum. Habit number eight: surround themselves by positivity. Surround yourself with like-minded, positive people. Eighty-five percent of your success in life is going to be determined by the quality of relationships that you have in your business and personal life. If you want to be a wealthy person and associate with positive, wealthy people, associate with the people who are optimistic and happy, and who are moving forward in their lives. At the same time, try to stay away from negative, critical, complaining people. Habit number nine: back it all up. Back up everything that you do with three qualities of perseverance, willpower, and belief. These are the strongest traits that every millionaire has. To have the courage to persevere in the face of adversity and disappointment, to have the willpower and tenacity to stay at it longer than anyone else, and to have total belief in everything that you do, are the qualities that show the true measure of the belief that you have in yourself and your ability to succeed. Habit number ten: gratitude. All millionaires are grateful for everything that they have: their friends and family, their health and spirituality, their business and their social life. Because without all of these, they can never truly be wealthy. Good luck. Do not go yet. One last thing to do: if you enjoyed this book or found it useful, I'd be very grateful if you'd post a short review on Amazon. Your support really does make a difference, and I read all the reviews personally, so I can get your feedback and make this book even better. Thanks again for your support. This has been High Performance Habits: Become an Extraordinary Person and Achieve Extraordinary Results, Including Miracle Morning and NLP. Written by Mike Deans and read by Jordan Reader. Copyright 2019 by Mike Deans. Production copyright by Mike Deans.